to let him the letters?
Good evening and welcome to the March 14th, 2016 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Aaron, could you please call the roll? Ms. Saunders? Here. Mr. Bealey? Ms. Oglis? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. Mazur? Here. Mr. McGee? Mr. Wood? Here. Thank you, and just note for the record, in the absence of uh, Mr. McGee and Mr. Bealey, uh, Ms. Saunders will be a voting member this evening. Uh, another quick uh, housekeeping note. Item number five, Valentine Development, Eastern Village, has been tabled at the request of the applicant, so we will not be hearing that one tonight. Next item is approval of minutes from the February 22nd, 2016 meeting. So moved. Second. The second, any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. Item number four, Christopher Klings requests an advisory opinion of a miscellaneous appeal application to the Board of Appeals for 411 Payne Road, Assessor's Map R38, Lot 23. Jay? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you just noted, uh, the application is before you for an advisory opinion um, in compliance with Section 3F of our zoning ordinance. Essentially, this says that a, a nonconforming use may be converted to another nonconforming use only if that conversion is approved by our Zoning Board of Appeals under the review criteria of Section 3 and Section 4. Those criteria spell out the process by which, before the Zoning Board takes action, they need to receive an advisory opinion from this Board. Um, so the, the, the site in question is currently a non-conforming use. The applicant is before you to convert it to what our ordinance would consider a pet care facility, uh, which is not allowed in the uh, zone um, that this is in and the applicant provided their review materials that accompany a uh, miscellaneous appeal um, to the zoning board. Staff reviewed that and by and large, you know, um, there's a lot of good information in there and we really had comments related to um, traffic cir circulation and parking as well as waste uh, disposal. So there's going to be quite a bit of pets on site. The sanitary district was very interested in understanding how that would work. So with that, I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thanks, Jay. And is there someone here uh, representing the applicant? Do you want, would like to come up and uh, give us an overview? Uh, I'm Christopher Klingis. This is my wife, Teresa. Sorry, you can do that yourself. <laughs> um, we own Muddy Paws in South Portland, and we're looking to move to this 411 Payne Road. Um, Again, we basically summed it up already. We're looking to change from a non-conforming use to a new non-conforming use, um, and we're happy to answer any questions that the board has. Okay. <coughs> uh, Robin, would you like to start us off? Yeah, I I don't have many comments. I was just wondering what um what about this site appealed to to you when you were in the market to look around. Uh, we've been looking for quite some time, uh, working with uh, Karen over at SEDCO, um, trying to find a, a good high visibility um, mm -hmm. place for us. Um, and that wasn't so much industrial as, as you know, we've been right now. Um, Well, yeah, one of the things that appealed um, that property is a nice looking property. Mm -hmm. It can be beautified further and we mm -hmm. want to create a dog care facility that is more like a home um, environment, mm -hmm. something with nice um, shrubbery and landscaping and something that's just really attractive to the eye versus <laughs> what we have now and what we've seen in other places that is very industrial and semi run down or dirty or what have you. So we're looking to kind of upgrade a little bit. Great. And my apologies. Um, if it was in included in the packet provided here, but if you can just talk a little bit about like your waste management um, disposal, both in indoor, how much goes to the sanitary district, and outdoor, what your your procedures are for outdoors. Sure, um, I'm not familiar so much about 
sanitary district. Mm -hmm. I know how we handle our waste at this moment and how we can we're planning to do it in the future. Um, we pick up solid waste, mm -hmm. bag it, and goes in a dumpster that's privately uh, removed every week. Um, and the plan that we have for development of the yards now will be turf, um, where there'll be drainage underneath that. The great thing about this facility already is the drainage goes into what's called a cistern. The cistern will filter out any negative things and only provide clean water back, <coughs> and then it gets removed uh, or it gets emptied at certain intervals. Okay. I think the idea of that cistern for AAA was to help uh, filter out harmful uh, chemicals, oils, that kind of stuff. Okay. So not necessarily addressing pathogens that might be in the... Oh, as far as we have cleaning processes that oh, okay. involve, yeah, sure, sanitization, um, you know, constant sanitization after a dog eliminates. You know, right now we have a mop system. Mm -hmm. We have a different type of system, but with the turf, there's going to be a spray that goes on there, and then it gets filtered down. The yards would be cleaned at the end of every evening, um, and you know, we have a. Our proposal calls for a wet-dry vacuum system that has the sanitization stuff right in the wand. So you spray the wand, then you vacuum off the wall, so it's really self-contained. And um, sounds like you've okay. thought of a lot of good things. I just encourage you to continue to reach out to the to the city to keep them aware of Absolutely. your your waste disposal practices. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Mm -hmm. Susan. Thank you. I'm assuming that the whole site is going to be used by yourself? Uh, we have plans to sublease the back portion of the... This is difficult for me because um, oh, it's over there. Okay. What is, is the Payne Road side considered the front and the Muzzy side is considered the back? Not in what I was just saying. Okay. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. When you say um, front I, and back. Do you have the sketch, ma'am, that we, yeah. that I, I mean, it's me drawing it, so. <laughs> um, but if you look... Because when I went to look at the building, the more office-like of, of part of it was facing on to Payne Road. Yes, ma'am. And, and I would consider that to be the front of the building for business purposes. And is this the part you're thinking of trying to rent out? Or the is that the portion that we would be subletting would be just this back portion. And if you, this is Payne Road, um, and I'm happy to... Am I looking at the wrong one? Yeah, the handwritten, hand drawn. Right, I sit here. Okay. She doesn't have that. I don't have that one. <laughs> you can it's use not mine. just me. This is Dwight Hall. It's not just me. This one? Ah! There we go. Okay, so this is pain road. This is pain road. And All right, it's, that's that, what I thought. And this is the area that faces mm -hmm. towards the mm -hmm. hub. Right. And the back area where there's trees. Okay, now you can take that. That'd back. be great if you could repeat that up there so everyone can. <laughs> everyone has the same information. So, um, yeah. this area here is Payne Road. This is the office area that we discussed. We'd share a lobby um, and have some pathways directly to the back, the, uh, back of the warehouse. To me, it's kind of two different um, sections there's an office section, and there's a warehouse section. Uh, the back of that warehouse section. Um, towards the back of the property, also adjacent to Payne Road, but between where mainly Tubbs is now and where we are is the portion that we would be subletting approximately five to 6,000 square feet to a dog training company that is kind of synergistic with what we do. Okay, um, this is a sketch plan. Yes, So when you come back for your preliminary, um, I'm going to have to have some. I need a copy of that. Okay, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm okay. surprised I'm, that I'm you don't have one. I don't want to make a deal, but I'm fine. So, so I'll have Jay clarify, but we're, this is actually uh, an advisory. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. This is an advisory the opinion the ZBA, to the, to the uh, ZBA. My apologies. Okay. Um, so, having driven around and about this lot, this building, I just want to confirm that I'm, I'm on the right page here. The parking area that you will be using is going to become your outside area. Where, where is that going to be working? How is that going to work? Um, 
Payne Road would be our primary, the access cut out from Payne Road would be our primary parking for customers. For customers. Um, we would take a portion of where the loading docks are on the Muffy Road side for par part of our play yards, yes. and the rest would be remaining for employee parking, which is negligible uh, with perhaps a, a walkway between the two. Okay, that answers my other question. <clears throat> How are you going to connect the two? And the parking area that is, would be accessed from Payne Road is sufficient for your customers and clients? As it has more sense. spots than we have than right now, have. and right now we service more dogs than we're anticipating at this location. Okay, so that is another one of my questions. This is to replace your present yes, location, not it's an addition. It's kind of a to change of business operations, yes. Okay, well, I, I think you'll be very successful in Scarborough. I have no doubt that you will. Um, I think that it's indeed, I guess because it's going to be a um, ZBA decision, um, I do have a question for staff about landscaping. We Do we have a chance to, to look at that or is that, how does that work? Because the landscaping is at the moment minimal and I know you have plans for it to be improved. Do we look at that, or does that just staff does, or how does that happen? Um, yeah, it, that's so. This item, because they're not doing any site improvements per se, they're not necessarily going to trigger our site plan review ordinance. Mm -hmm, that's um, why I'm asking. And so. so, through the zoning board of appeals process, they could do um, they could take a look at that as. If that's a recommendation coming from this okay. board. Um, I think that might be one way it could be broached. Um, so. Okay, that's what I was looking for. I would like to suggest that when our recommendation to the ZBA, which I think should be a positive, yes, that something be added that um, landscaping be. And I don't, I'm not even going to try to figure out how to word that <laughs> and who's going to decide whether it meets the, the, the desires that we have. And you took care of the. Um, on the um, and then, again, we're talking about number E on your presentation says the professional look that you're aiming for coinciding with matching the exterior look and feel of a portion of the built office portion. You're not planning to change anything architecturally? No, ma'am. Uh, with one small exception, we are exploring the option of adding a passage door um, to the right side if you're facing the front of the office building um, to match the existing entryway okay. as an exit. Okay, but basically the architecture will remain the same. I don't have any further questions. I just want to say I, I'm pretty sure the ZBA will feel the same way. This is a, it's a huge improvement over what's I love AAA. They've saved my life on more than one occasion. <laughs> but they obviously do not include the maintenance of their property as part of their, one of their top concerns. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And before we move on, just a kind of a procedural question, Jay, for staff. Um, there's been a mention of possible subletting of this property um, that would be, at least as the applicant is thinking about it now, would be a sort of a complementary use, would that fall under this uh, this uh, request to the ZBA in terms of a, uh, would that be considered sort of the same ancillary to that other non-conforming use, or would that, would that require some separate future approval? Well, I, I, my understanding is that the application is really for the sort of pet care facility to be the whole, the entirety of the site, so how that, you know, whether it's two sort of ancillary businesses, um, but it falls under that pet care facility <coughs> type use, then that would be part of the, the review. Okay. Um, it should be mentioned that this building could be used as an office space, which fits the zoning, and mm -hmm. that wouldn't require any review. Right. So if there is a component that they say, all right, we're going to take this thousand square feet and make that office, well, then that becomes a conforming component to the to the um, to the uh, so to so the in site. theory unless unless they decided to to sublet to some other non-conforming use correct that was not pet care they would be covered 
that's my understanding the way okay. their application is okay. written out. Yep. Thanks. Um, Ron, do you have anything? Yeah. Um, so again, so I'm clear. It, it, it's going to be, your subleasing is going to be to a training type operation. Yes, an existing dog, training dog company dog right now. Type. I'm sorry, sir. Dog, dog. Yes, sir. Dog training. Uh, first of all, I, I, I want to state that uh, your numbers, which you grossed in 200, 2015, are some very impressive Thank you, for sir. the type of operation that you have. I, I, I find that extremely impressive. Uh, I only have a couple of. Uh, Insulary. My colleague already talked about the uh, waste, um, and I, I know you said that the driving would be on the paint mode side. Is another cut on the muzzy side? Are you going to use that for anything? We would just have employee parking there, I believe. But how would they? Is there an entrance on the muzzy there side? There is, sir. and that's how they would come in. Your employees would be on the muzzy side. Correct. Now, my only other question. Um, I'm somewhat familiar with the area. There aren't any private homes to, within that little vicinity, is there? Not within a mile. And I'm, of course, I'm talking about the barking of the dogs. That's that's mm -hmm. that's what I'm getting at, which sure. is inevitable. I mean, I've been to parties in which people are louder than that, but uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, that that's good. Okay, I, I I'm anxious to see your final plans, and I you know I I think it will be a good addition to that facility, and I, I don't think what's been emphasized is that it was a 24-hour facility up till now, and it was AAA, and there was a lot more traffic, and there was a lot more uh, occasion for uh, uh, spills and so forth and so on. So I, I look at going from one non-conforming type to a very favorable type of non-conforming, and I think it's a logical location for your type of operation, and I wish you well. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thanks, Ron. Mike? Thank you, Corey. Uh, yeah, I think you've, uh, you've done a really good job a answering the questions that, that we ask as far as impact to the site. Um, and you've answered the waste, the waste question to my satisfaction. In your packet, it talks about a proposed um, uh, look of play area walls. Yeah. Is that, so a wa is that a wall that is to be constructed? Yes, sir. Um, Again, this is kind of conceptual at this point. Um, the uh, area here that's noted in black with the X's, that would be where we would keep our play art. Uh, they will be indoor, outdoor yards, so they, the dogs could come both inside and outside. The outdoor portion is significantly smaller than the inside, um, but in order to maintain the look of the building, there's a brick face on the office side, we would like to have walls that are similarly faced. Um, so you look at it, looks like a, an estate type of look and feel as opposed to fencing, sure. uh, chain link or otherwise. Now, uh, for staff, uh, that wouldn't trigger a site plan review requirement at all, in your opinion? It's not that I'm necessarily interested in seeing them come back. But. Yeah, no, I, I think that that is probably, given that that area is currently paved area for access to the building mm -hmm. and that it was garage bays that were being accessed for these vehicles. This is sort of going to be accessed and utilized. It, it wouldn't have the level of change that would trigger full site plan. Review. Okay. And uh, again, Jay, uh, have we looked at, uh, is it, has the applicant submitted uh, traffic um, opinions? as to what the impact will be for the Not site? Not beyond what was in the original packet, okay. which was sort of the discussion about the change from the AAA activity being the 24-hour activity and their limited hours of occup uh, mm -hmm. occupation on the site. Okay. So it's your opinion, the staff's opinion, that the, uh, the impact as far as traffic goes is going to be uh, no more and likely less? Um, yeah, I think in, in our comments we referenced that it was unclear still. Mm -hmm. um, that was their comments that it would be less. Uh, it, I don't know how many trips come in and out, come in and out of that site. So, um, no, I, I don't know that staff has that opinion okay. one way or the other, frankly. Right. <laughs> well, certainly uh, if there is a um, if there is a procedure, is there not, that if, if the use ends up being more than what we envision here tonight, would we ask the applicant to... Um, to come back for an analysis or review or? Well, one of the, the review criteria that the zoning board has to look at is that the, um, that the proposed use, so again, this is converting from the existing non-conformance mm -hmm. to the new non-conformance, that the proposed use 
will not have will not create any unsafe vehicular traffic conditions. So that's really what the zoning board needs to find. Um, so it was staff's comment that it, it it seemed to staff that you know for the zoning board to be able to make that determination. If I felt that there might be okay. some additional evidence that could be provided um, before they go to the zoning board. Yeah, might be a good idea because because they'll, they'll go in for the depth than we uh, depth than we will. Because they'll have to do a formal right. binding and approval. So should the zoning board of appeals approve it, and and then ultimately the traffic is more than was thought. Well, they've been approved. They've, mm -hmm. they've sort of they're in. So that's yeah. mm -hmm. carry on that point. Um, in a change of view situation like this, too, in a commercial context, um, this area is located in the Payne Road area where we have impact fees. So if the zoning board finds that traffic is more, that is something that they should mm -hmm. likely examine. Probably not significant impact fee amounts, but that should, that should be looked at. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, is there a proposed sign, new sign, or? There is a sign on Payne Road that is available for our use. You don't plan on improving that or just changing the? I don't know. We haven't. We would consider everything. Okay. You know, if it if it's acceptable, suitable, looks good, then probably not. But if I don't know what it looks like. Or, right now, there's nothing on it, and there hasn't been anything on it for eight years or so. I would personally, uh, along the lines of uh, my colleague uh, Susan. <laughs> Speaking about uh, landscaping, if you see an opportunity to improve what might be there today, it is absolutely in our plans, sir. Uh, that's something that wouldn't necessarily require you to come back here. That you can work with staff, I'm sure, but I would invite you to do that. I do so have we'll some further information about the traffic stuff because the comments were sent to me as well. If you'd like <coughs> to hear that, I'd I be think happy. I'm okay at this okay. point. But um, like uh, Jay says, that the, uh, the zoning board of appeals would really be looking in that uh, in further depth. So. Um, I'm happy uh, with uh, boarding the favorable opinion, and that's it for now. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. Um, I don't think I have a whole lot more that hasn't been covered already. Uh, just picking up on the traffic question, and again, this will be something that the zoning board will look at more closely, but um, understanding that we're going from a, sort of a 24-7 use to a completely different type of use, um, presumably there will be sort of, um, I don't know if you'd call them peak hours or rush hours when you'd have drop-offs or pickups, and you mentioned that you anticipate the volume at this new facility to be maybe a little less than what you've been doing. What are your projections right now, um, just back of the envelope or whatever analysis yep. you've done in terms of what you would expect on a sort of a typical uh, morning and, and afternoon? So our company has a philosophy about smaller group sizes. Um, in order to manage that with this type of size facility, we're going to downsize our current capacity. Uh, right now we do 77 dogs in a day. We're going to downsize that to 60 dogs in a day. Um, that's a combination of boarding dogs and uh, daycare dogs. Um, so if you consider um, 60 dogs, if every dog was coming for daycare that day and they all came in separate cars, you're talking about 60 cars in the morning, 60 cars in the afternoon, we have observed traffic patterns with our own uh, daycare right now with the 77 dogs, which is typically in excess of 70 dogs a day, where we have high volume times or steady volume times between 6 a.m. and about 9.30, 10 a.m. And what I mean by that is it's not unlikely that we get two, three, four cars at once. We'll get a car come in, we get the dog up and inside. In our facility, we have to go upstairs. When we come back downstairs, someone's coming back with another dog. It's a pretty constant flow. It's a very busy time for us internally, uh, which is one of the main reasons why we'd like to go to something that's more efficient for us. Um, but you're talking about those 60 cars being spread across a three to four hour period. And likewise in the afternoon, three to seven is the pickup time. Okay. That's helpful. Thanks. Um, I like my colleagues, I think I'm satisfied uh, with your response on, on the waste management, so to speak, and um, uh, I certainly uh, am in favor of this and recommend that we uh, pass a favorable opinion on to the, uh, to the ZBA uh, with the encouragement to the applicant that they explore opportunities to upgrade the landscaping and, and signage where there are opportunities. Um, 
and uh, we certainly encourage the CBA to uh, look closely at, at the traffic generation as part of their typical review. I don't know if we need to be any more formal than that. In light of what you just said, I came across a photo that does have the sign on it, yes, which right now is higher mm -hmm. than what we would like to see. So you might just at some point take a look. Staff can help you on what the signage would be if we could uh. wave our magic wand and say, <laughs> yeah, this instead of this. And also lighting, just to make sure that the ZBA, in our, <coughs> in our notes to the ZBA, that they ask about lighting as well. Okay. Thank you. Just so we would include, in, I guess, as, as part of the advisory opinion, our favorable opinion to the ZBA that they, they look at traffic, landscaping, lighting, and signage. Right. Um, again, not with the expectation that it be anything onerous, but that, that, that it at least be considered. And um, we would wish you the best of luck. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Again, item number five was tabled at the request of the applicant. Item number six, 299 Gorham Road, LLC requests site inventory and analysis review as part of a plan development review for property identified as 299 Gorham Road, assessor's map R35, lot 9D. Okay. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. As is noted, the applicant is before you for a site inventory analysis phase of a plan development review for property that is uh, within the Running Hill Gorham Road Mixed Use District, also known as the RH, and the Running Hill Gorham Road Transition District, RH2. Um, board members will might note that the plan development is a three-step review process, a very measured approach to uh, projects uh, um, in this area and of this size. Um, site inventory is really the first step, which ultimately culminates in a master plan, which then drills down into the formal site plan and subdivision review process. Board members will recall or may recall this item was before you in December for a sketch plan. At that time, the board had asked for the Conservation Commission to provide comments. Um, so the applicant was before the commission in January, and you will have received their comments as part of your packet. Um, as I noted, so the site inventory phase being the first uh, part of the three-step review process, it's really an opportunity for the town and applicant to gain an, a better understanding in, of the opportunities and constraints for the use of the development parcel. It really is in, intended to recognize and address uh, constraints on the site, the areas that are sensitive, and those areas that are um, best served for uh, development, most suitable for development. Um, so, you know, to that end, the plan development provisions enable significant development densities in those areas that are identified for suitable uh, development. In return for that flexibility, it does seek for the preservation of those uh, significant natural features and or cultural features that might be identified on the site, though, um, as we'll note going through the review process, it's really a very undeveloped site at this point. Um, and so just moving forward tonight, the site inventory analysis phase is it informational and it really doesn't result in any formal approval or disapproval by the board. It's really, in, as I mentioned before, an opportunity to identify those areas that are most suitable for development, those areas that are most sensitive um, as the applicant moves forward to that master plan phase. Um, and so that's really what, what tonight's discussion is about, it's about identifying the opportunities and constraints. Um, just the first item that staff noted um, in terms of the uh, planning board's review is sort of a threshold question. One of the review criteria for site, site inventory is the identification of vernal pools. Staff went through all the review criteria and found everything was, was uh, submitted but for the vernal pools. The applicant provided uh, their rationale for seeking the waiver. Um, and part of that, um, I'm sure they'll go over, but identified that that will be presented as part of the master plan process. And, if anything is identified, then they'll sort of deal with the ramifications therein. Um, and so that, that'll be an item that the board uh, will want to address at the outset. Um, also, just note that as part of the sketch plan, the board had asked 
that the applicant, again, as part of the site inventory uh, submittal requirements about a market study. Uh, the applicant has provided that for the board to review and consider in, in terms of what the RH and RH2 districts uh, seek in terms of uh, development patterns and densities. Um, and then moving forward, as I noted, uh, you know, the applicant has received um, at least two round of staff comments through sketch plan and prior to going to conservation commission, so they've had an opportunity to address many of what we had uh, previously identified. Um, and really at this point, um, just want to bring, uh, flag a couple of comments in terms of the design. Um, in terms of conservation commission might really want to take a look at ensuring that the road alignment is correct. That's one of the critical aspects to the site as um, Red Brook runs through the site and so be sure the road alignment is correct for that crossing location is uh, pretty critical in terms of uh, preserving uh, Red Brook and ensuring that it's certainly an urban impaired stream so we don't want to have any further adverse impacts on that. Um, and so I guess with that, Mr. Chair, I'd turn it back to you and here to answer any questions along the way. Thanks, Jay, and I'll turn it over to the applicant. Thank you and good evening. My name is Steve Harding. I work for Sebago Technics. Uh, unfortunately, tonight I don't have the applicant, applicant with me tonight. Uh, Ken Grondon was, uh, has called away at the last moment and wasn't able to make the meeting tonight. Sends along his apologies and hopefully we can get through this meeting without him. Um, the uh, Jay kind of gone through the summary of, of where we're at. We did meet with you folks back in December 7th for a sketch plan review. Got some uh, good feedback from that uh, session. And then we went to the Conservation Commission on January 11th, had another good conversation with those folks, um, and are here tonight with the inventory analysis uh, stage, hopefully addressing those comments. Just to give you a little orientation of the site, um, the property is about 89 acres shaded on this particular exhibit. Gorham Road is over here on the right-hand side. That's a major um, thoroughfare. We have about 900 linear feet, I believe, frontage along there. Um, Running Hill Road would be over here on the right. There is actually a part of the parcel that connects the new road. However, as you can see, the teal represents wetland areas. The lighter green are some upland areas. So even though there are upland areas there, that's an area that's uh, relatively wet and also adjacent to Red Brook, which bisects our property over here on the southern side uh, of the property. There's also a tributary area here that bisects the property, and again, another uh, large expanse of wetland and upland uh, complexes. Uh, we've shown the developable parcels or parts of the parcel in brown and broken those up into pods. This is one, two, three, and four. And the intent is to de develop those pods in a series of four or five phases with the first phase being right here along Running Hill, uh, excuse me, Gorham Road. Um, it's zone RH and RH2, as uh, Jay had mentioned, uh, allows um, planned developments with fairly in, uh, significant densities uh, for residential and mixed uses. Um, the uh, pod number one represents an area of about three acres between Gorham Road and Red Brook. Um, we currently envision that to be a, uh, an area where we could put in some duplexes, a series of duplexes. We uh, think that would play well with the Nunsuch Golf Course, which is right across the uh, Gorham Road from that area, and would provide a transition zone into the um, further um, central parts of the parcel where there's more developable area available to us. The pods there represent about 35 acres of the 89 acre uh, parcel. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm fighting a little bit of a cold tonight. Um, as far as the constraints uh, that we have with the site, obviously Red Brook cutting through the portion of the site there represents a, a significant uh, resource that we'll need to protect. Um, the Conservation Commission wanted to make sure that we would to cross that with an open bottom culvert. Uh, there are also provisions you could do it with a submerged uh, rectangular concrete box culvert as long as you sum submerge the uh, bottom of the concrete box deep enough to allow the, the flow to go through in more of a natural state. Our preference would be to do the pipe arch and I know Ken uh, being a contractor has already talked to some folks and has some preliminary designs of things that he would like to uh, incorporate there and 
Um, so we, we certainly recognize the Co Conservation Commission's uh, preference, and that would be our preference as well. Um, also, Inland Fish and Wildlife brought up uh, a recommendation of uh, providing a 100-foot setback from the wetlands that are associated with Red Brook. Um, along the southern side, those wetlands are fairly tight to the uh, stream corridor itself, so that um, lends itself to putting, bringing in that buffer. As you go on the north side, however, there's a wider uh, array of wetlands and they have fingers that work into the site. So we would need to probably work with the DEP and the Army Corps to, more so the DEP, I would think, uh, to kind of establish where the core wetland boundary should be to start that buffer area. Uh, Jay did mention that we overlap 5-2 in that area. Um, that was done more as just a general area where these would come, not a, not a, a uh, obviously designed uh, approach yet. However, there may be opportunities in those uh, buffer areas to provide for something more enhanced than what's there now. We may be able to plant areas with better vegetation. Uh, we may be able to use different types of vegetation. I know in some projects we've used to uh, introduce some thorny vegetation in areas we want to keep people out of or keep, uh, you know, uh, vehicles out of. Uh, also, there's the, the potential for just uh, replanting some of those areas or, or working around those. So we would look to, in, when we get to the development stage for um, development pod two, look more closely at those setback areas. Obviously, in a lot of areas along here, we've provided more than 100 feet of uh, buffer area, and that would uh, be our plan going forward. The other area that we would also enhance with a buffer would be this tributary area. We'd also look to provide a 100-foot setback off those wetlands as well, again, uh, focusing on the, the primary wetlands associated with the brook. Um, as far as the wetlands go, there's a table on sheet three of our packet. Uh, in all, there's about 26.4 acres of wetlands. Uh, in the individual pods, the pod near uh, Route 1, uh, Gorm Road, excuse me, uh, would be, there's no wetland areas there. Um, pod 2 has a 11,600 square foot area of wetlands. And that's primarily these fingers that work their way through the site. Um, pod 3 has about 19,000 square feet, and that's up here. And at this time, actually, I wanted to, I brought along a handout. Jay was, one of his comments noted that we had somehow missed, gotten, missed this wetland. And essentially what we did when we brought in the pod to uh, designate that area, the shading of that pod, it actually covered up the wetlands. So I brought along some exhibits tonight and brought along a couple of large ones in case folks are challenged. Thank you. And then in pod four, that this pod here is this wetland area is about 19,000 square feet, and then a small pocket over on the yeah. north side of pod four. Yeah. Those wetlands in the pod area is about 32,600 square feet. The roadway itself has another 3,100, uh, excuse me, 31,000 square feet. Yeah. Lots of them are fingers that cross through the wetland areas. We would look as we go the roadway and go through any of the wetland permitting, we'd need to do that through the DEP and the Army Corps. First criteria would be avoidance and minimization and uh, looking for ways to minimize those wetland impacts. And uh, with uh, the area that we're showing in the pods in the roadway, it's approximately 1.5 acres of wetlands. Obviously, we'd want to minimize that if we can stay under an acre of wetland impacts that doesn't, uh, that allows us to stay out of the individual permits uh, stage and that we could go through that process. There is uh, an in lieu fee program available to us for impacts above 15,000 square feet. That's often done for projects like this. And uh, we would obviously look to mitigate those, in, uh, those impacts as we go forward. And I believe that was a comment as well from the Conservation Commission. Uh, Jay touched on the uh, vernal pool issue. I guess we're asking for a partial waiver or a waiver of that for this evening. Um, primary reason is that uh, the vernal pool mapping season is coming up 
probably sooner this year than other years, but in April and May, uh, the wetland biologists will go out and look at uh, pools. They'll go out, actually make two trips out to check on different species of pools of, of, uh, of uh, uh, critters that hang out in uh, vernal pools. Um, it, the DEP has a fairly um, standardized program where they count egg masses and depending on the species you have and the number of egg masses, that dictates whether or not they consider the vernal pool to be significant or not. If it's significant, you go through their uh, process. The Army Corps is a little uh, more open. They pick any, any area that has a, a vernal pool, regardless of size, and any number of egg masses would be considered something they would look at. That could be as simple as a skitter path that they've made ruts. Uh, sometimes trees fall over and they create shallow roots, uh, shallow depressions where the roots came out. So we'd have to work with them. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, the wetland report that was done by Boyle noted two areas. There were some pockets of potentials along uh, Red Brook and other areas over here in this uh, large area of wetland and uplands. Um, the ones along Red Brook they noted were shallow, so they didn't think they would be uh, potential for significance from the DEP standpoint. Obviously, being along the floodplain corridor, um, kind of would bring into question how sustainable those are. And uh, there's also a culvert up here at New Road that's uh, currently impounding part of Red Brook. At some point, the town is going to be improving that culvert so that it will allow more for the free flow of, of water through that. And depending on where the, vernal, uh, where the pool might be, that might also affect them. Uh, the areas over here that was talked about in the report are fairly remote. Um, two of the criteria that the DEP and, and the uh, Army Corps look at is the areas around it, the forested areas, and the uh, essential habitat close to the wetlands. So we feel if, the, if there were a vernal pool in that area, that we could work around that with our design. So we're asking <coughs> you tonight for that to be um, set aside to the master plan stage. Obviously, when we get to that point, if we do have uh, vernal pools, we'll need to work with both the DEP and the Army Corps and uh, actually in the town as well to make sure that we incorporate those uh, features into our design. Um, another point that came up during our analysis stage was uh, the site distance along Gorham Road. Um, we, are, we know that you know as part of this development when we reach a certain level we'll need to do a traffic analysis of the, of the development. Um, the MDOT has uh, designated Warham Road is a mo mobility arterial, which would require a, a site distance of 710 feet, which is fairly substantial. Normally for a 45-mile zone, you'd uh, expect a site distance around 425 feet. Uh, we know we can get that. We've sent the surveyors out to look at that. We feel we can get that, but unfortunately we would require tree removal along uh, the Gorham Road, which we'd prefer not to do. So as part of the next step, we'd want to have a conversation with the DOT and discuss this mobility arterial and ways to soften the uh, need for such a substantial site distance. Um, obviously, we'd like to, to make that as, as uh, narrow as reasonable or short as reasonable while still meeting the safety criteria. Uh, another piece that uh, Jay touched on, utilities. Uh, the applicant, Ken Grondon, has been working very closely with the town to uh, look to extend sewer over to this uh, part of the turnpike. Woodard and Kern has done a study on that, and they've uh, come up with some suggested improvements or suggested routes. Uh, that sewer uh, extension would not only help this parcel, but also several parcels uh, around it. You have uh, a lot of development potential along 114 as well as properties over by uh, Running Hill. Uh, and I should mention as part of the traffic uh, piece that we are looking to extend the roadway across my body land to the north and Ken has had ongoing and active conversations with that landowner and uh, those have been very positive. Uh, and so if with that roadway alignment, we would also look to extend sewer in that area uh, to provide um, that resource to other properties along Running Hill. Uh, water, we also extend, or would expect to extend through the development and possibly loop to Running Hill, and that would be a conversation we'll need to have with the water district. Um, part of the analysis 
or inventory analysis stage was to talk to the uh, historical preservation folks. We've included a letter in the packet. They have uh, no concerns with historical properties associated with this. Uh, Inland Fish and Wildlife has, uh, has noted that there's no essential habitats associated with the parcel. They've also brought up the issues of Red Brook and Vernal Pools. And they also mentioned uh, bats. Um, last year at this time, there was a lot of uh, confusion with the northern long ear bat, which is listed as a threatened species of the federal agencies. Um, there were some fairly stringent temporary rules put in place, uh, primarily a restriction on tree cutting between April 20th and October 15th. Uh, since that time, the federal agencies, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, has gone through and issued a, a 4D ruling which uh, significantly streamlines that process. Uh, essentially, if you're not near a, a place where the bats hibernate in a substantial, I think they call them, hib I'm going to screw up the name so I'm not going to try. Um, hib um, so it's a place where they hibernate, and there's only about four of those in the state of Maine. So as long as you're not within a quarter mile, none of those are in southern Maine. And they also have a term for maternal roosting tree. You can't be within 150 feet of those. And, None of those are listed right now in Maine. So you would send in your uh, notice to them before any activity where you might be uh, impacting wetlands and trees. They would go through a process. They will likely suggest some conservation me measures that are voluntary, and one of those is not to remove trees during June and July. So the applicant has the option of doing a bat study where you'd go out and actually test um, using equ acoustical equipment, run tests, and see if there are any uh, northern long eared bat uh, species on the site, or he could voluntarily uh, not cut trees between the June and July time frame. So we're looking into that as, as we continue. Uh, we also, at the request of the planning board, did a market study. Uh, as Jay mentioned, it's primarily residential focused. Um, it did find that there, there was significant support uh, for this type of development in the area and that uh, it would maintain throughout the development period. Um, we did, again, look at this area next to uh, 114 as an opportunity for duplexes, figuring that would be a nice uh, transition with a golf course and going into the <coughs> parts of the site, which you'd need to cross Red Brook to get to. Um, you know, we felt that that would be a, a good uh, mix with the current uh, residential properties along Gorham Road as well, and that uh, there are discussions in the uh, in the RH2 and the RH zone about having uh, open areas that also uh, was part of the marketing study. They suggested uh, village greens or walking paths. Um, they tended to discourage uh, developments that had pools or tennis courts or, you know, uh, clubhouses and that sort of thing, which is in keeping with what uh, I know Ken's goals are. Uh, we certainly wouldn't want to preclude having a commercial development in the other development pods. Um, Tom Dunham from the NIA uh, Dunham Group has been marketing this property for five to seven years. He's shown it to a, a bunch of commercial type developments, everything from high-end laboratory uh, operations to high-end manufacturing of medical equipment, actual medical users, uh, office space users, and uh, even, uh, even a church. Um, but all those commercial users have been discouraged with the, the lack of sewer in this area and having that uncertainty of not having uh, sewer capacity for them has, has kind of turned them away. Uh, we think that now that with the sewer being extended to the property, that would open up possibilities that maybe this so far haven't been able to be uh, capitalized on. Um, I think I hit on all the topics that... Uh, the Conservation Commission and, and that Jay brought up on his memo, but certainly would be here to, to discuss anything you may have a question on. Thank you. Before we move to uh, board discussion, we do have the opportunity for public comment. Anyone here would like to get up and make any comments? This would be your chance. All right, seeing none. Uh, Mike, would you like to... Hmm. I don't know where to begin, really. Um, it's awful lot to take in. Um, 
I'm curious, how, well, how would you cross over the turnpike to extend the sewer? Is that where it would come from or from another direction? Uh, the studies that have been done, there are a couple of different alternatives that have been looked at. Um, we would have to directional bore underneath the turnpike to, to do that. Um, what we're anticipating, there would be a force main somewhere in the lower part of the property. Um, we would gravity drain to it and then pump up 114 and then under the uh, turnpike to connect into the sanitary district uh, services. And we've actually met with the sanitary district and talked to them about um, various options and, and what they might be looking for for a <laughs> pump station if we were to put one on this property. So there wasn't discussion about hooking into a, a neighboring municipality? Uh, no. And I don't believe we are close enough to do that uh, without some, sig some significant obstacles. I mean, turnpike's not one, no. But I think we could work around that. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's not easy, but we could directionally bore underneath that, and that's typically what's done in those types of crossings. And it's a force man, so it's a typical installation. So, um, I mean, no action is required tonight. We're just discussing the site plan Correct. analysis or the... And it's, it's really a discussion as to has the applicant identified mm -hmm. those areas that are suitable for development. If not, th there could be subsequent site inventories or if the board's generally comfortable. It's sort of a, yeah, there's no formal action, okay. but if more information's needed, you can request it. Uh, did you, did, last time we saw you, uh, you talked about um, the envisioning and phasing this, this um, development over time. And um, did you speak to that today as to what pods would You'd lean towards developing first. What order you might see it in? Yeah, the the way that um, Ken and I have talked about this is uh, first we'd focus on the development pod right, right next to uh, 114. That's the easiest point to get to, and it avoids crossing Red Brook. Um, once that works, obviously we'd have to be planning for our crossing of Red Brook, making sure that we're not doing anything in phase one that's going to compromise that. But if you're looking at the, the, the development pod number two off to the eastern side of the site, this development pod number three you might do in one or two phases, depending on how it played out. But that would likely be the next phase. And then development pod number four would probably be the last one. Um, however, if somebody came to him with a development that was substantial and something that, that made sense and was a good fit for development pod four, he'd obviously move that up in the queue and take that one on when and it was appropriate. Have you labeled the pods as to whether you envision a com uh, commercial, a residential, or a mix? Well, right now we're showing them. Certainly this, this first pod, pod we're, we're thinking is going to be residential, and we've looked at duplexes, and we've talked to, to various marketing people and building people. Uh, so I know Ken's had a lot of discussions about that, so that's probably where he's leaning towards now. The other ones aren't as uh, set in stone. Obviously, the market study would support you know, residential and, and the other pods. Uh, again, if there were opportunities that presented itself, and maybe with the, um, with the introduction of sewer, that, that might op open up some, some other opportunities that are kind of closed right now. Um, do you envision it uh, potentially developing completely as residential? That would be one potential. Um, obviously, Ken would be open to other opportunities, and I think he would, <coughs> excuse me, he would market the, the properties uh, appropriately. And again, he's looking at this development pod over here as maybe a more suitable commercial type development mm -hmm. than the other pods. Okay. Well, um, I really don't have anything else to say. I mean, I could talk about it for much longer, but I'm not sure that I'll really bring anything of value. <laughs> um, it's a nice layout, and um, it'll be interesting to see how it matures through time. Certainly, uh, this is the uh, accelerant, if you will, that would allow for sewer to cross over the turnpike and open up a whole host of other opportunities, not just like, like the gentleman said, not just for this property, but for many of the abutters and then who knows further on in the future. So that in itself is enough to 
to keep me engaged and excited about the prospect of it. But I appreciate your very thorough analysis and, and discussion tonight. Thank you. Um, if Ken were here too, I think he'd want me to, or would want to point out that this, he envisions this to be a kind of a living document and a yeah. long term back and forth with the board. Um, he has had some very successful past projects at Larrabee Road, more of a contract zoning type arrangement, but where he came in and here at various times and said, this is what we were planning to do, but it doesn't work out for this reasons, and you know, work with the board and adjust this as we go. I think the only real decision we need to make tonight is whether we're okay with deferring the vertical pool survey. Yeah. yeah, I'm okay with Next deferring step. that survey, sure. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Corey. Yep. Ron? Yeah, I, I was just about to address that, and uh, I'm okay with deferring the, uh, the survey on the vernal pools. Uh, the other, other comment, uh, well, I have a question first. What's the distance between uh, pods like uh, one and two? What's the area between them uh, distance-wise? Distance there? Yeah. I would say, you know, the, the uh, crosshatch area is about 100 feet from this stream edge, the uh, south stream edge. There's probably more so on the other side because the, the wetlands are hotter and we kind of showed that being pushed over more. So I would say there's probably 150 feet from Red Brook to that, that area. So the what way it's shown here graphically, probably 200 to 250 feet. What about part two to part three? Part two to part three, this is, there's a right of way in through here. I think this is drawn at 60 feet. So it's probably more in the, the 100 foot range in the narrowest point where that uh, is shown kind of a potential intersection area on sheet three. The reason why I'm bringing it up is that uh, I know we're just doing an analysis and like the chair said, we're only discussing uh, the okay to defer the room. But if there's any thought of doing mix and matching as far as uh, housing is concerned and commercial, uh, I think in the big scheme of things that you have to take into account what the distances are as to what would fit and not impinge upon one another. And that's, that's the point I'm trying to make here. Uh, you know, like my colleague over here, there are a lot of loose dangling particles uh, as far as the overall project is concerned. Um, I'm, I'll be curious to see because there are a lot of wetlands involved here in, 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 in the big project, and uh, there, are, there, is a, there was a lot of concern about from the uh, conservation board uh, about protecting the areas in, in Red Brook and so forth and so on. And uh, uh, I know you've done your homework somewhat, but I'll still be curious to hear how it's all going to come together in the next phase. But I have no problem with, with deferring. Thanks. Susan? I also <clears throat> I'm also fine with um, what will be a very early spring. So we can probably do vernal pools next month, but I'm sure that it'll get done. I don't have any problems with that. My biggest concern, well, let me ask you, for the sake of discussion, if the connector to Running Hill Road is not possible, how long is the road from 114 to the end of the um, applicant's land? A rough estimate would be about 4,000 feet. I've looked how at it, excuse me, 4,000 feet, and I think the ordinance calls for, I'm looking at Jay and Dan, for like a 2,000 linear foot um, deadline, which I think roughly brings you into the red dot here. So if roughly I'm not mistaken, speaking. that's as far as you could go if you don't get the connector to the Running Hill Road. Yeah, we'd have to... There, there may be other alternatives to get to Running Hill Road. There may, you know, and, and okay. wouldn't be desirable. We could. I'm just saying that I think that. New road or, I hear but, what you're saying, but I think <coughs> that in terms of the kinds of things that can remain open, mm -hmm. and it can and it be fluid, and things move. One of the things that I'm really very concerned about is that one of the things that I think needs to be tied down is this whole thing about primarily what residential. That's not what we had in mind originally. It was a mix. And if you don't have a connector to Running Hill Road, bringing in much of anything but residential is going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So it is my personal request that finding a way to connect to Running Hill Road is a very high priority before you come back. Mm 
-hmm. because that will help us decide what do we do about something that was designed or discussed, I should say, as being a mixed-use environment that now is being used according to the traffic, not traffic, the um, real estate, um, thank you, review, would be, quote, on, I'm not, I don't want to say this exactly, but it's certainly the development would support residential. Mm -hmm. Will it support more? I also know that whether or not the um, sewer comes across is going to have a lot to do with that as well. And the example of the kinds of things that want, the kinds of businesses that wanted to look at it, but the sewer is what mm -hmm. kept them away. These are, the, these are the pieces that I think are most important to look at. I know that Red Brook is very important and everybody knows that Red Brook is very important and I can't imagine that this town is going to let the applicant do anything that's going to in, in, um, affect the health of Red Brook. But I'll just put my vote in there as well. Mm -hmm. But my biggest concern is that the pieces that seem like really big ones connecting to um, Running Hill Road and are we going to be able to get the sewer in place is what's going to drive whether this is going to be seen as residential only or a mixed use. And I think that we as a board and, and are, are going to be very concerned about that. Mm -hmm. And I can't see any kind of permitting going on for anything. I may be wrong, but that's my own personal feeling until that's straightened out. I'm looking at Dan's um, um, comments. And I think that the, one of the most important ones is at the bottom of page two where he says, It'll be um, the town's commitment to assist in this initiative is closely tied to the master plan for development of the site and the plans and potential for a range of mixed uses. It'll be important for the town council to understand the specific development plan and value and intensity of that development as it needs to compensate for the cost of the sewer infrastructure. So if the town's going to be involved in this, it has to know a lot more than we know now mm -hmm. about the future. So I, I appreciate uh, what you've got here. It's very helpful. It shows me a great deal more than I knew before about just where the pods are going to fit in. But those, that's my major concern about the presentation. And um, also, I just because I'm an open space person, I see these little signs that say open space um, towards New Road and then down mm -hmm. on the, um, what would that be? Uh, let's see, this is north, east. Yeah, east, right, down in there. And you know how that all comes together is interesting to me, but we don't have to get into it tonight. Mm -hmm. So I think everything else has been said, and um, you've done a great job of giving us an overview, and uh, we look forward to hearing about how the rest of it's going to fit in. Yeah, I, I think you hit on all the key points. Um, you know, the Running Hill connector, Ken has been working very actively with that. We've had some very good conversations with that landowner. I know we've exchanged some preliminary documents and. So far, everything has been very positive from that person, uh, and I think Ken understands the importance of that, and I think you hit on the possibility for a commercial partial uh, development is going to be in, impinging on that. Um, the Red Brook part, um, you know, I think uh, Robin can speak more eloquently than I can. Uh, most of the Red Brook's impairment happens more towards the commercial development, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be protecting the headwaters, and certainly uh, it's Ken's desire to do that. Um, you also pointed out Jay's comment about the master plan and, and we agree that you know we felt a marketing study had to check the box of the, does the, the, would the residential part be, uh, be able I to I understand care. that. So we, did, we needed to do that um, and I think the other important part that sewer would not only open up possibilities here but also areas <coughs> to the north and along I think that that's the point. This is a major step. This is a huge project. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea that it's not designed to be really residential, mm -hmm. residential mixed use, I think is the number one flag for where, where what happens when things actually start to happen. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going to be hanging our hats on. Yep. I just want to make sure that's clear. And, and the two spots you noted as open space, um, I know in the <coughs> zoning it asks for, uh, I believe it's a common space. You know, Ken has talked to us about a village green. We feel like when we get more into the isolated developments of the pods, we'll have more opportunities to, mm. to pull out those those types of developments. And yay for the bats. What's that? And yay for the bats. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I said nothing else. Thank you. Thanks. Robin? <coughs> so I'm going to start with the, the stuff that I don't know that much about, Steve, and 
and um, so I, I beg your forgiveness here. Um, so let's talk about talking about the mixed use residential type information. Um, it sounds like what you're saying is once we get the, the, the city or the municipal sewer and water there, if you build it, they will come. That then will come commercial. I think without a more potential for without that. sewer to this site, you're looking at a very different mm -hmm. development. Okay. And I think there was one for the recession that was basically a single family homes all okay. septic systems. And that's pretty much what this parcel would would end up with without the sewer. So so I'm wondering kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. So I'm wondering if a comprehensive market study would have shown that versus the residential housing market study that was done instead? Would it have identified sort of the residential fact or the, the more commercial factors kind of thing? I think people would have, you, you could have projected or speculated that, you know, some of the uses that I that I had talked about would be able to, to come here. Um, I think, you know, we really focused on the residential piece just to make sure, you know, if nothing else, that passes muster. Okay. Uh, and again, Ken isn't against doing something from a commercial development, mm -hmm. but he feels pretty strongly that you know this this piece here best suits itself for residential development. Uh, we would do a mar marketing plan, show lots. Um, you know, again, when we get to those pods, I think uh, you know we need to to look at those and see if they make sense for everybody. Okay. Excuse me for just a minute. I just yeah. want to ask staff if I could too, if. Um, a comprehensive market study, does that give us more information on commercial potential? It certainly could help okay. to highlight what the area could accommodate. Okay. Dan, you have more to offer on that, but... Yeah, I think that's, that's true. I mean, Susan's comments earlier are kind of right on. There's there's town, central town participation involved yep. in the sewer extension, so yep. the more diverse and kind of robust this development can be yep. um, and the more responsive it can be to market forces, the, um, the more surety there is town assessment is good for the town and also for the developer. So mm -hmm. that's why those are included in staff comments. I mean, this you know, yeah. development could occur and perhaps it's not a residentially attractive location, maybe more commercially. Uh, as time goes on, it would be good to have that flexibility. And one of my colleagues had previously mentioned too, maybe we could tie into another neighboring town instead. How far down Running Hill Road is South Portland's line to connect? Has, has, is the committee who's who's looking at that been considering that as well? Yeah, the long ago, the probably should use the mic. Oh, I don't know if this is or not, but um, some time ago, um, back in. 2008, 2009, when this area was rezoned initially, other sewer alternatives were looked at, mm -hmm. most particularly looking at tying into South Portland on the Gannett Drive subdivision where sure. Anthem office building is. Mm -hmm. And that got in pretty complex because there would be three different communities involved. That wastewater uh, actually goes to Westbrook, Westbrook through right. South Portland system um, and is very distant to this project, particularly okay. the end of this project that they want to start on. So okay. in terms of alignment, this recent study that Wooder and Curran did that um, the applicant referred to looked at three or four alignments all leading to the beginning of this development project versus the northerly end and um, they make a lot more sort of logistical and economic sense than mm -hmm. trying to connect to South Portland just given how yeah. many parcels and yeah. uh, distance uh, in between this one and that sewer line. Yeah, I'm just thinking of directional drilling under the turnpike too. That has its own challenges, so thanks. All right, so I want to back up then, um, Stephen. I'd like to ask you then how, after receiving the the recommendations from the Conservation Commission, how did your overall plan change? Well, it didn't change a whole lot, Robin. Um, they brought out some things that we were already thinking about and okay. just reinforced those points. Um, the uh, open bottom um, crossing a Red Brook, as you know, the Army Corps would have a 
have a lot to say about that, and that's kind of the preferred way to do things, mm -hmm. although we could use a submerged bo box culvert. Uh, they talked about um, using uh, LID and green, me uh, green infrastructure design measures. That's kind of a common practice these days, and we'd obviously like to implement that in a, what we do here. Certainly would be part of uh, the town's review of our stormwater system at any, any means. Uh, they talked about minimizing impacts to Red Brook, you know, through the buffers. Um, <coughs> we'd certainly be looking at that. Um, so if we could stop right well. there then for a minute. Let's yeah. talk about the buffers to Red, yeah. Red Brook. Um, because um, I'm seeing the Conservation Commission talked about a no disturb buffer within 100 feet of the floodplain, not its bank. So mm -hmm. does, does, is your map, I, I'm looking at like sort of the 100 foot offset. Mm -hmm. from Red Brook here. So does that capture the floodplain? And knowing that we have a lot of wetland up there? Mm -hmm. Not not the floodplain as I would understand it. Okay. Um, and my understanding of setback rules with the DEP through the NRPA, they don't particularly look at floodplains. They look at wetlands. And on this side of Red Brook, the southern side, the wetlands are fairly close to the Red Brook corridor. They expand more so on this side. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually went to a seminar that Mary Beth Richardson from the DEP spoke about, and they wouldn't look at you know the edge of a finger of a wetland as being where that 100 foot would start. They would look at the primary wetlands associated with Red Brook. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a really a field determination where I would expect we would be out there with folks from the DEP looking at this and you know, when we get to the point where we're developing pod two, yeah. that would be an important feature. I think one thing you have to remember, Robin, is you know, we've got literally Red Brook goes all the way to New Road. There's probably a half a mile mm -hmm. of Red yep. Brook that we influence. We're really looking at a small area along there. We've got the um, edge with uh, pod one. We've got a small corner of uh, pod two that we need to think about. Right. But we are and we've got the roadway crossing. My apologies. We are looking at very valuable headwater space, though, and uh, and an in impaired water body that, you know, the city, the the town has taken great lengths to move mm -hmm. forward with a watershed management plan. So, mm -hmm. my next question would be to staff then about the um, setback, the shoreland zone setback. I know that as part of the watershed management plan, um, sort of steering committee, we talked about having a 250 foot setback versus a 75 foot step setback in shoreland zoning areas. Did that did that come into effect in the town? The, that was discussed extensively okay. um, during the watershed planning process. Yep. And after a lot of discussion, the final watershed plan didn't make a recommendation to um, create a wider buffer to the, the main stem of Red Brook, okay. but instead recommended in this particular watershed, the headwaters were most important and maybe most vulnerable. So the recommendation was to establish 75 or 50, a, a, diff, a buffer. That's right, okay. To all the headwaters, right. um, which currently aren't protected. Right. That ended up being um, the okay. compromise during that process. Okay, thank you for the clarification. So <coughs> my read on this though, Steve, is that it's um, not just from the 100 the foot setback is not just from the wetlands and tributaries, it is from the floodplain kind of a thing. So, so I guess with that in mind, you know, and going back to Jay's ultimate goal of us identifying the areas most suitable for development, um, how, how are those captured here? Is it the orange that we're looking at? Yeah, it's the uh, brown areas on the okay. map that are most suitable, the areas we're Primarily staying away from obviously the Red Brook corridor, the tributary corridor, these areas outside here that have upland islands but have mm -hmm. significant wetlands around them as well. Yeah. So one of the goals of LID is to, you know, basically maintain the pre development hydrology. So considering the amount of the amount of trees that will probably need to be removed from here. Um, how do you plan to maintain that? Because a lot of times once the trees go, any type of wetland area just keeps getting wetter kind of a thing. So if we could talk a little bit about maintaining that. Well, the development pods, as you know, will need to go through stormwater management systems. Yep. 
a lot of those would reintroduce water into the groundwater. A lot of them would convey surface water to the receiving tributaries. So we would follow those types of procedures. Um, we're still maintaining uh, a lot of wooded and, ve and open vegetation throughout the site. There's 89 acres here. Yeah. Those development pods are about 35 acres, so yeah. you're looking at maybe so a 40 percent development area. 40 percent of the entire? Of the entire okay. parcel. You're looking at wetland areas that okay. at the most are an acre and a half. Obviously, we'd like to avoid those as much as possible. I would submit that an acre and a half of wetlands over an 89 acre parcel in Scarborough is a fairly small wetland impact, relatively speaking. Mm. And obviously the cumulative add up, yeah. We would want to stay under an acre if we could. And obviously, if, if everything was ideal, we'd stay under 15,000 square feet. That would be the simplest permitting exercise for that. Okay. Um, so, with that said, I guess, um, how has, how will you see this minimizing impacts to Red Brook? And then also, let's think about the stormwater management. You know, you said putting it into groundwater and surface water runoff. I imagine groundwater is pretty high, and as my old static mm -hmm. professor says, you can't push on a rope. You can't get it down into the mm -hmm. ground in these very wet areas. So yep. have you given any thought to stormwater relative to sort of on-site control? At this stage, we're identifying problems, and that is an issue that yeah. we'll need to address. I agree with you that infiltration okay. probably isn't going to be ideal on this site, given how wet it is. Um, but we are going to look at doing all the stormwater water quality and water quantity treatments. So we don't anticipate, obviously, adding any more peak flow to Red Brook. Okay. And we anticipate that our water quality measures will meet the state and the town standards. Okay. Um, okay, so that's that. I just, I just have a couple more. Um, so one of the, one of the charges to the planning board um, as far as uh, this site inventory phase is that it provides the board and the applicant to op op uh, the opportunity to begin this discussion about design alternatives kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So how set in stone are these, like if you were to come, if you were to get your vernal pool um, inventory back and it's, you know, right smack in the middle of, you know, pod one kind of a thing, um, are you feeling like there's an opportunity to move away from that or can you talk a little bit about your design alternatives? Yeah, basically, if we, if we'll use the vernal pools, the areas that the boil reported, report were Potentials were along Red Brook and over in this area here. Uh, with the area along Red Brook, uh, that report also said because of the shallowness of the potential areas, they didn't think that there was going to be a significant um, vernal pool from a DEP standpoint, that the, the uh, topography didn't lend itself to that. But um, so if we did find something that was significant for the DEP, they have a 100-foot essential habitat zone around the ver vernal pools mm -hmm. that are difficult to impact. Yeah. Um, I thought the depth had to do with a significant wetland, not a significant vernal pool. Uh, I could be mistaken. I, I think the comment was a significant vernal pool. Okay. Um, you know, if, if it were over in this area, that, that area is yeah. more remote. Um, just for the sake, let's say they found one here. manner. Okay. Um, but we'd certainly be able to work around those. Um, they also they have an in lieu fee that you could pay. It's usually not uh, something that's financially desirable for, for applicants to do. So it's a okay. So one of the design considerations that we were to talk about tonight too is the road alignment and making mm -hmm. sure that that seems appropriate given the constraints and limitations that we have on the site. So um, can you can you talk to us a little bit about uh, any potential adverse impacts that the that the current road alignment has? I'm smiling because if Ken was here, he would speak passionately towards it because he's very much involved with this. Okay. Um, you know, he likes the road alignment because it really works well with the topography. There's some shelves that mm -hmm. are nice to catch along the way. 
Um, you know, obviously we're looking to cross Red Brook in a narrow point, make one crossing. We're looking to, to get through some of these wetland areas with as minimal impact as we can. Um, you know, there's a potential maybe we maybe we want to get up above this area, but you know, you have other spots of of wetlands that you end up going through, and then to get to the development pods and use those, you might end up actually impacting more. Um, we've kind of threaded that through roadway through and an area that at this level we feel comfortable with. Obviously, as the design continues, we're going to be looking at that. Mm -hmm. We'll have to look at that because the DEP and the Army Corps, once we get over 15,000 square feet, are going to, mm -hmm. you know, ha going to require us to look at different alternatives. That's right. And road design, it's all about what? Three things: drainage, 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 right? Yeah. No. Got a lot of a lot of things to think about as far as the alignment is concerned. Um, but we also, but we also have. Uh, some significant, you know, um, terrain relief. Yeah. And the, you know, the, the hardest way to design a road isn't any relief in the terrain from one point to another. As long as you've got areas that you can work with, which we've looked at, and Ken has strongly looked at. Okay. We feel pretty confident that we can deal with it. And you, I mean, are you in touch with the staff too, or is Kat, Ken in touch with the staff? Um, at the town on a regular basis, at touching base on on that or no? Uh, looking at Jay, I would okay. say so. When we, okay. we, Good. We, when we continue forward, you know, we're going to want to probably increase that intensity. I mean, right now we're really looking at just identifying what the constraints are mm -hmm. and not so much specific design issues. Right. And um, the last thing I would just comment on is um, the on uh, Jay, I believe it's Jay's comments. I'm not sure if they're Jay or Dan's com staff comments that came on March 14th. The last comment is. Um, Given the date and the directive, um, this is a, a perfect opportunity, I think, to have a peer review for both the wetlands, the vernal pools, and the floodplain offset that the Conservation Commission has, has talked about. So that's my final sort of ending thought. Thank you. Did you have something? Oh, I was just on that, that final thought. Um, you know, Jim Boyle's been out there doing the wetlands. I, I you know, looking at it from a very high level. I consider them to be fairly con cons uh, conservative given that they've picked up some of these past um, agricultural aspects which sometimes you don't see in a wetlands report. And uh, we certainly, you know, as we go forward, we're looking to um, reintroduce the flags along the wetland boundaries so that everybody knew where they were and we make sure to keep our contractors in bounds and on, on point. Thank you. Uh, so I, I think I appreciate your uh, thorough overview and sort of point by point um, recap of things, and I appreciate that you did it sort of along with the staff comments within that framework. It's helpful for us to kind of keep things organized and track things. Um, you seem to have a pretty good handle on not only the, where the where the site opportunities are, but even more importantly at this stage, where, what your constraints and challenges are. Um, clearly have you know, a fair amount more homework to do and there are going to be things to tackle in more detail going forward. Um, talked about wetlands identification. Um, I'll, I'll echo the comments of a couple of my colleagues on the, on the sewer. Uh, the sewer question which is very closely interlinked with the, the mixed use concept and I understand it's a little bit of a been a little bit of a chicken and egg or catch-22 type thing to this to this point where at least up until uh, now where, where it's been more of a hypothetical prospect the notion of having municipal water and sewer available um, but again as was pointed out in the staff's comments and was voiced by by Susan um, you know this really was intended to be um, mixed use and we want to make sure that bear that in mind going forward, especially given uh, the, the fact that there seems to be a, a strong desire, uh, understandably, uh, to uh, to have that phase one along Gorham Road be duplexes or, or some sort of residential. That then makes that potential link to Running Hill Road even more critical, as was, as was pointed out. So I would just echo uh, what Susan said about really um, continuing to pursue that, and I'm glad to hear that it sounds like that's moving in a positive direction, but we know that um, 
can't can't uh, take anything for granted. Uh, so hopefully, if things move forward, we'll we'll see that get solidified, and that can help sort of flesh some things out. Um, I appreciate you working with Conservation Commission, and I'd like to thank the, the commission for for taking this on and putting in the time to not only get the site but meet with the applicant and put together some thoughtful comments for for our benefit and the applicants. Um, I'm fine with the deferral of the, the vernal pool survey. Uh, seems like a common sense measure. Um, and uh, I don't know that I need to belabor things any further. I think we've, <coughs> we've covered them pretty well. Um, I guess a question for staff. If there was a question about, um, it was noted in staff comments, and Robin mentioned it just now about peer review, things like wetlands delineation. Given how this process works, this multi this multi step process, is that something that if we were going to ask that the applicant engage that would make sense to do at this stage or could it potentially be done a little bit further down the line? I I guess I don't from what I from what I see and I I think I think the applicant is um, generally correct based on what I've seen and that what, what has been done seems fairly conservative. I don't see anything that seems to be jumping out as a potential threshold issue that would throw off this overall concept, but I appreciate your feedback on I guess the timing of that. I, I guess, yeah, go ahead. So, some initial thoughts I had in, in terms of that is one, uh, certainly the vernal pool study is going to have a great impact on understanding, uh, particularly as the applicant already talked about, really, you know, this is a, a many year multi phase project. Um, and so I think if we sort of look at it in those terms, really understanding phase one and the Red Brook Crossing are sort of the essential components right now, probably in the next year to three, however long mm -hmm. that's going to be. Um, and then phases two, three, and four, likely, you know, that three, four, five time frame out. So to me, it wouldn't make a great deal of sense to sort of go out there now and do a wetlands peer review of the whole site. But as those specific components come in, I think, you know, that Redford crossing area in particular, I think, is where it probably does make some sense to have that done as the vernal pool study is done and, and, um, and sort of when all that's fresh and when we can get out there, understanding that you can really only do vernal pool studies and surveys in a very tight time frame. That if we don't catch it this year, we're asked. That's another year out until we could get a peer reviewer out there. So I think if that is something the board is interested in, then yes, I think, and, and staff, if you know the board's um, comfortable, staff would be willing to work with the applicant on understanding sort of the constraints of that area and limiting to the, the areas that make sense. As I said, mm -hmm. in those areas of the crossing um, and and the pod one um, at this time. Um, so if that's something the board and applicant are comfortable with, um, that was sort of the approach I was thinking might make sense mm -hmm. in the short term. Then we can sort of take it from there as time moves along. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's an approach that makes sense and it sort of addresses the, the threshold question. Yeah, I would stage. just throw out there too that Maine Inland Fish and Wildlife would have a, a say on the significance. I believe they, they check on those. Um, and the Army Corps, if we were to find something in a skitter rut or a depression that we said, well, it's a, technically it's a vernal pool, but it's, it's really not a very significant one, we'd probably want to meet with those folks on site and have a look at that and evaluate that. So. Uh, if the board wants to do a peer review or feels more comfortable, I think we're okay, but just rem remember that the regulatory agencies and Inland Fish and Wildlife and the Army Corps would also have a very significant say in the, the vernal pools and what Trump, whatever our consultant or the peer reviewer had to say. Understood. Susan, did you have something else? I'd just like to vote in favor of, it, of doing <coughs> the peer review on a um, section by section basis mm -hmm. and to go along with um, getting it involved with this phase one. <clears throat> I also would like to just reiterate that I, I'm in favor of having something and I think that the applicant can work with staff as to what that something might be and if, if they need further input from the board they certainly should feel free to come back to the board but some kind of expanded um, market survey for when is it appropriate to start talking about the balance between commercial and residential 
because I agree it's the chicken and the egg which comes first and we're not going to be able to talk about a sewer until we know that the applicant is willing to do commercial and they're not going to be willing to do commercial until we talk about the sewer and we can't talk about either of those if we don't have a connection up to um, Running Hill Road or some other location. So somehow or another, I don't want the need for a market survey to get to get pushed aside. I don't know the right timing of it, but the applicant and, right. and staff. And I, would, and I would say that with that, with that it particular issue as well as some of the other things that we've discussed, while they may not be quite, as, you know, quite as far up the priority list in right. terms of time sensitivity, um, I think I think the uh, applicant is hearing that it's something that we're going to be looking at and that we'll want to see more on going forward. Right. I just want to second what Susan just said, though. I, I agree with her 100 percent with her comments, just for the record. Thank you. Do you need anything more from us at this point? I think um, no, I guess um, maybe just a general path forward. I, I'm assuming we're going to do this vernal pool study and then we would start working towards the master plan. Is that appropriate? And at that time we would look to further the development plans for phase one. And I know, Jay, we talked a long time ago about being able to go forward. Is there a Sure, the ordinance sort of talks about, um, yeah, we talked about this, I think, back, way back at sketch plan. So, yeah, it's probably mm -hmm. worth dusting off. In, in, uh, by in general, the ordinance does allow for larger projects to be, you need to do the site inventory on the entirety of the site so you have a general understanding of, of where development makes sense and, and where it shouldn't happen on site. Then what the ordinance allows for uh, larger sites is for a master plan to be taken in smaller chunks because the master plan is really when you start to get into more of the site details um, general road layouts. But one thing that we'll need to look back in the ordinance that it does talk about is that the there does need to be a uh, conceptual infrastructure plan for the entirety of the site as part of the master plan. So there is going to still be a component of the next submission that is going to still take a look at the entirety of the site. But then the more site or, or uh, detail specific type elements can be zoomed in on just that uh, pod one that the applicant has talked about wanting to do now. So um, staff can certainly look at the specifics of the ordinance language with the applicant to walk through that. But okay. um, so there is still the overall umbrella whole parcel component, but there are certain bits we can start to take smaller bites at. Um, so and again, that's at the discretion of the board. So it probably is worth a discussion or a brief head nod by board members if that's a, something you're comfortable with, which the record show we're all nodding. Yeah, we're all <laughs> nodding. Up and down, not <laughs> side to side. <laughs> right. okay. Thank you. I just want to thank Jay and Dan, too, for their help and uh, patience with us as we work through this. They've been very instrumental in helping us get along this far. Good. Thank you. All right. Item number seven, Waterstone Gallery LLC requests a site plan amendment review for Lot 7, Scarborough Gallery Subdivision, Assessor's Map R37, Lot 3307. Jay? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let's see, I think many board members will recall this uh, site. This is, as you just noted, Lot 7 in Scarborough Gallery, uh, currently the home of Bob's Furniture and PetSmart and a few other sites that have just recently opened up. Um, but let's see, so back in 2014 when the site came before you for its approvals for the main building, there was a second phase of the development that was part of the plan and at sort of the uh, end of the review process, the applicant sort of put a hold on phase two because they weren't sure who those tenants were and now uh, moving forward to um, to 2016, they have a, a firmer concept of what they'd like to do with that phase two lot. Um, and so it was originally identified for potential for two separate buildings. They now come forward with one uh, combined building, one building. Um, just by way of background, um, the site, this lot 
was approved as part of the overall Scarborough Gallery subdivision, which includes Walmart at one end, Lowe's at the other end, and obviously this lot. Um, that overall subdivision was approved uh, uh, back in uh, the early 2000s, and at that time the town had what was known as our economic development overlay standards, which is really the precursor to our current land development standards, some of which we started talking about with the last applicant. Um, and so in those terms, a lot of the, those uh, critical elements have been looked at, and this site has been approved for development. Um, Going back to our original sketch plan in 2014, one of the elements that the board asked the applicant to look at to be consistent with our current, with the site plan review standards and design standards was, is there a way to bring the two buildings that were shown at the time closer to the road? Um, and so the applicant, I think, has tried to, sh to carry that comment forward with their uh, recent proposal. Um, and they're actually looking to reduce the front yard setback to about 20 feet. So that's just something for the board to consider uh, in terms of the going forward. Um, staff has reviewed the elements that have been provided. Um, you know, in terms of the detailing, we think there's a little bit more to be fleshed out, but that t this up tonight pr uh, provides a good opportunity to give good direction to the applicant to hopefully, um, you know, we can move forward to uh, a, a determination by the board uh, in the, in the uh, near future. So in terms of comments, uh, we had some questions for clarity regarding the parking summary for the site, um, stormwater comments or um, considerations, there was some clarity we saw around that as well, as lighting, utilities, and other uh, issues. One of the um, other elements that I wanted to mention was in terms of bringing the building closer to the street. Um, the ordinance typically seeks to ensure that any sort of uh, um, uh, service areas are well screened from the, from the site. There are dumpster pads, enclosures sort of on either side of the building and, sh and ensuring that there's consistency with those, with those and the overall plans that um, the board has a full understanding of what that will ultimately look like. Um, and then finally, just ensuring that the site is well coordinated with the overall development pattern um, of of the Gallery Boulevard and the existing building. Um, so those are some of the details. One other thing that I uh, want to have the board talk about tonight, and maybe we can take this in two separate sections, is um, when the applicant was approved for sort of two phases of development out here, it was with the sort of understanding that phase two would be left in a, in a clean and, and reasonable uh, maintained fashion, which by and large it has been, but there are a couple of elements that are on the site currently. There's a large um, concrete block that I think is to be used in the construction of this phase, and there's some um, uh, 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 light poles that also, I believe, are intended to be used for this phase of development. Um, as part of the certificate of occupancies and review of the larger building and those tenants, staff has been identifying that as an issue. The applicant or the developer has requested an opportunity to speak with the board about those details. Um, and so we'll sort of take that up this, this evening as well. Um, if the board is so inclined, at this point, the developer understands that those need to be moved unless this board finds um, that they're acceptable in the, in the short term until uh, development on this site begins. Uh, so that's what I have for you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I will turn it over to you, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Nancy St. Clair. I'm with Waterstone Scarborough LLC tonight. Uh, Doug Richardson is here. He's in the back row. Uh, we wanted to talk to you a little bit about phase two of lot seven in Scarborough Gallery. Jay uh, gave you a nice overview of sort of the history of it, and I just wanted to take you back, not to the original, but um, back just a couple of steps in history so we can kind of know where we came from uh, to get to this point on uh, the phase two plan. I did not make a mistake here. This is the sketch plan that was presented to you folks back in January of 2014. So I wanted to start there. That was when we presented, first presented the plan for you uh, for the general layout that you uh, approved back in October of 2014. But one of the things I wanted to point out kind of ties in with what Jay had mentioned with regard to the setbacks and where we had buildings placed and how we moved them through the process. So 
If you look at this plan here, we had retail E and retail F that was set a bit back from Gallery Boulevard. There was a parking area and an access drive around the building. Uh, this layout for the, the main buildings, A through D, hadn't changed, hasn't changed, and if you've been out there lately, they're open and uh, pretty much well occupied now. So, <coughs> in response to the comments that we received during the sketch review, one of the requests was to, in keeping with uh, the program to move the buildings closer, we actually shifted Restaurant F and Retail E closer to uh, Gallery Boulevard, so you see we have the majority of the parking on the sides and the internal face of the building uh, on both of them. This was the plan that was approved back in October of 2014. At the time, we had Retail E and Retail F as part of that phase two. That condition compliance that you saw in the materials that we provided was to come back to you folks uh, with the phase two plan. But as part of that, we also wanted to present to you what which as you can see on the monitors and you can see on the, the rendering here, is a consolidated phase two <coughs> building. We've basically taken the restaurant piece and the retail piece as opposed to having them in two separate buildings. We actually have them in one consolidated building. Mathematically, the sum of the square footages was slightly less with the two separate buildings than we have now. The difference is about 405 square feet total. The total proposed building for phase two now in one building is 7,525 square feet. It's about a 50 foot deep building and it's a little over 150 feet long. It does sit right along Gallery Boulevard. We do not have any parking or access around the, the side of the building. We still do anticipate that we would have a mix between a restaurant and retail space. We envision that the restaurant would be sort of on this end and the retail on the other end, although the tenant layout hasn't been formally finalized on the internal. We do expect that there's going to be around a 4,000 square foot restaurant. If you remember from the original plan, we had about, about, about a 4,500 square foot, excuse me, 4,800 square foot restaurant. So the restaurant piece got smaller, the retail piece got a little bit bigger, and the overall square footage got about 405 square feet larger. So with that, uh, one of the things that we had been asked to do was to provide an updated traffic letter. We've requested that of Laurel Palmer. They were our original traffic engineers on this project. They were the original traffic engineers on the overall subdivision. So they have a wealth of history and knowledge about the trip generation, the expectations as part of the project. So we'll be providing that information for you folks as part of our follow-on work uh, with you and the, and the staff. So. From a layout perspective, we talked a little bit about the setback. We are up against Gallery Boulevard. We are asking formally for you folks to authorize us to be within about 25, uh, excuse me, 20 feet of the right of way for Gallery Boulevard. As you know, the setback in this district is 50 feet, but you folks do have the latitude to reduce that and has been our understanding and are uh, supportive of that program because of the, the feel for the, the layout uh, accordingly. We have parking uh, and access on, for customer access on the inward side of the, par of the uh, building, as well as parking on the sides. The points of access that you see to phase two area here and here are the identical locations that, was on the that were on the original plan. We're not proposing any changes to the points of access to Gallery Boulevard. We're not proposing any changes to the points of access internally to the site. So basically what we've done is this layout here from a parking standpoint is relatively similar to the prior plan. This orientation here is relatively similar to the original plan. If you'll see that little wedge right in that area there, the original parking actually followed along the back edge of the sidewalk and we have a little bit of a uh, wedge because the parking kind of straightened out as opposed to following the curve along that internal road. The building a uh, small retail building had been located in this area here. This is now parking and access so that we have access to be able to get to dumpsters on this side of the building as well as access here for loading and service as well. So both ends of the building would have loading and service opportunities. So you've got one for the retail, one for the restaurant type use. This site is a very prominent building. It's very um, 
much a different type of a setting where in a service area you don't have that sort of back side of the building to, to work with. And as Jay pointed out, screening is, is key uh, as part of that, especially when you do have to deal with the service areas on a prominent location like this. So we had proposed that these uh, areas here be fenced in and the landscape plan had screening along the sides here and then screening along the sides here uh, within the planting areas as well as part of that. One of the items that was raised as part of the staff memo is a request that there be a uh, rendering provided of the street view of this building uh, in the context of the site so that you folks can see you know, how the screening and buffering is taking place on the site. Uh, I have talked to the applicant about that. We're willing to provide that fo for you folks. It's going to take a bit for us to do that, but in concert with the architectural elevations as well as the rendering, we would be coming back to you folks to present that so that you could see real life view of, obviously we have these buildings here. You folks went through the whole review process with the materials and the colors and the elevations and all that. They're up, they're occupied, they're active. Uh, it's a great backdrop to see this new building in the context of that. We've been through this process before. The applicant is well aware of the need to coordinate and follow not only the coordination with these buildings, but the overall scheme for Scarborough Gallery itself with the hierarchy of signage, with the uh, building materials, colors, landscaping, all those features that, although they're not um, formally, they were not formally at the time, the um, sort of master planning process, they were under the economic development overlay review and that was all set forth at that time. We will have building mounted signage for the tenants. We are not proposing any new site signage. The uh, sign for the project is located here and that will remain uh, as part of that. Uh, but we do have, obviously, we would like to have building mounted signage for the tenants themselves. We have received comments from your peer review engineer uh, with regard to some of the site issues and we will work closely with them to address some of them. Some of them were just clarity uh, of information that we had provided on the plan. Uh, the spot elevation question, there was a question about some spot elevations and the contours. This is a very flat site. The spot elevation and the, the computer generated two foot contour intervals don't necessarily al always show the nuances of the grading, but we can certainly provide a one foot contour interval and work uh, with staff and your peer reviewer to address those comments. Wanted to touch a bit on stormwater. Um, that's the piece that was recently reviewed uh, and approved by the DEP. We have a modification to our site location permit that was received last week. You folks have it. Um, as part of that review, the, comp the uh, drainage on this site is rather complex and it goes back to the original design uh, and the original approvals when this project was first built back in 2005. I'm just going to give the overview because it gets really detailed. <laughs> But basically, this site is part of the Scarborough Gallery subdivision. The drainage for Gallery Boulevard actually came into the site, passed through the site in three different locations. We have an existing storm drain line that comes down here, and there's an existing wet pond that is behind Retail D. And Retail D is the new uh, Marshall's Home Goods building that just opened up. So this wet pond was designed back in the master plan for stormwater back in 2005 to address the runoff from a portion of Gallery Boulevard as well as a portion of this site. There was a very specific amount of impervious area from this site that was designed to go into the wet pond. At the time, <coughs> there was a master plan envisioned for development of this site. At the time, that included underground storage for runoff that was in this area of the parking lot. The sliding scale total suspended solids was the approval requirement at that time. It was changed. The standards changed, but the project had a permit. So when the development came forward in recent years, one of the changes that happened was we needed to meet the current standards for the portion of the project that changed. Well, what changed was this layout here, no underground storage. 
So we needed to meet the current standards for runoff that came from this area of the site. That runoff was met by the bioretention cells that you see in between the parking areas uh, on the project. In the original approvals back in 2014, we had roof drip line BMPs for the two buildings. We had these areas here are part of, there's actually 10 bioretention cells on the site. But the phase two area, the majority of it went to the pond. There was a small area here that collects, I'm go back a bit, the, one of the second points of connection of the runoff from Gallery Boulevard is right here. If you've been there, this is right across from Red Robin. There's an open area right now. That connection, physical connection, was not made right in this area here when phase one was built. So Gallery Boulevard comes into the site, comes down through, goes out, and goes back across, and there's the rest of the master plan for stormwater for the Gallery Boulevard subdivision, if you will, Scarborough Gallery. So this portion of the site was designed to discharge out through this area here. So the majority of the bioretention cells, once they provide the treatment required, discharge right here and go out through the site. So as part of our phase two plan, we are connecting that open connection. And we have a piece in this area here that does not get treated but that ties into that drain line that comes down through and goes out. Our recent revision that we had uh, received from the DEP last week addressed that in the fact that it affected our treatment efficiencies on the site. We dropped a little bit, but we're still above the standards. The third point of access, just for clarification, is right here where basins from Gallery Boulevard actually tie into that same drain line come down through and go across here. So there is a piece right here that ties into this system. It's not formally treated, but it ties in and there's over on lot six of Scarborough Gallery, there's a large area that was part of the overall stormwater master plan for Scarborough Gallery subdivision. So that piece discharges out into there and the remainder of the site in this area along with portion of the parking area here actually comes down and goes into the pond over here. So it's split. The treatment efficiencies are pretty complex because it is split, because it has history, um, but we have reviewed that all with the DEP. Uh, the DEP has been with us through the whole process uh, on this, and the permit that we just received addressed that change in efficiency for that. So with that, I'll turn it over to you folks. They have the stormwater treatment down. I think we need a flow chart. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, we do have a chance for public comment if there is anyone who is interested. Seeing none, we will go to the board. And uh, Ron? Yeah, uh, let's start with the obvious, which was the stormwater presentation. And I'm going to leave that to my colleagues down at the end <laughs> and to the staff as to whether they find that sufficient and adequate and uh, it's beyond me. But uh, let me address some other things uh, that are in front of me. Um, the two buildings are going into one and there's one part of it is going to be a restaurant. And you're only estimating though what the restaurant is going to be, or do you have a definite, I don't need a name, but do you have a definite tenant? It's my understanding that there are two key tenants that are interested in this space. It hasn't been refined yet as to who will actually be in there, so I don't have an exact number for you. That's why they're ballpark numbers at this point. The reason why I bring that up is the obvious ordinance as far as seating and uh, then parking is concerned. Yeah. And uh, that needs to be nailed down. Uh, as far as that, <coughs> and, and let me go back a step. Phase one, I'm, I, I like a lot. Uh, I think they did a good job. Uh, I think it's <coughs> well into the into the overall scheme of things. Um, it's where again, remind me where is going to be the entrance to point out again where the entrance is going to be to phase two. Phase two. 
Mm -hmm. Phase two. <coughs> there are two entrances to phase two. Two entrances. Okay, go ahead. Okay. The first one is right here. Which is where? Which is where is that in relation to everything? I'm sorry. This <coughs> building right here is the Marshalls Home Goods building. Okay, I know where okay. that is. Okay. So if you come in here, Walmart's going to be on your right. Yep. You're going to turn left to come in. Marshall's Home Goods will be on your right, so you're, you're and you'll take an immediate left to enter into the Phase 2 area. So there's one of them, okay? Yep. You continue along here, and there's the second one. So that's in front of, um, well, it's before. Bob's is in the, on the end here, so it's in sort of the central space here. Right here. And then this is your entrance off of Gallery Boulevard that's in front of Red Robin. Yeah, all right. Um, landscaping, have you touched on that at all? Uh, we have provided a landscape plan as part of the application materials. I can tell you in rendering it that um, the plants that I uh, rendered in phase one, I used virtually every single one of them in phase two. <laughs> so the plant list is um, very, very similar. Uh, the patterns as far as the uh, where the uh, sort of entrances are framed, that type of thing, there's tie-in uh, with regard to that in the phase one landscaping. Um, that from a street perspective would show up with the um, photo rendering that we're proposing to provide for you at a later date. Um, but the plant materials, they're, it's the same landscape architect did both phases. Uh, and it's basically the same plan. The perimeter of the phase did not change. So what you see for plantings, well, there we go. For plantings along here and along here was what was on the original plan. Okay, one of staff's comments was the landscaping to uh, buffer waste collection areas. Is it going to do, and the loading areas, is that going to happen? That comment was provided back to our landscape architect as well, and we'll, we'll certainly follow up in specific with him on that. There's the two dumpster areas there, and there's a dumpster area there. So he had provided, as part of the original plan, some additional landscaping right in this area here, and then on that side as well. And then he's got landscaping here. You can't really see it on the rendering, but there is landscaping here and here. And those would be fenced in, screened, fenced in. Uh, the reason that they have the length is to address one of the comments that came through with regard to the fire department wanting to have the dumpsters 10 feet away from the building. So that's why they're longer than what you would typically see in the need for a dumpster enclosure. But we wanted to separate it from the building, but also keep it so it's all screened, you know, by the building, et cetera. But, but it is going to be 10 feet away, right, <coughs> the dumpsters? We are proposing that the dumpsters would be set 10 feet away. We will be working closer with the architect as we move forward. To tr One of the comments, and we agree with it, was that there was some building windows shown in an area where we had a dumpster, which obviously isn't going to work. So um, we'll be working closely with the architect to refine that, but it's landscape architect, architect collaboration to place it and screen it. But we do understand about the fire department requirement. That's why they were longer in the first place. Okay. Um, the HVAC system, another, that was another comment from staff. Uh, has there been any, especially if you're going to have a restaurant, right, you're going to have to have, is, is there any discussion been had on how that's going to be handled in the, the building? We will follow up with the, the architect on that to make sure that those those uh, elements of the building uh, are screened. Um, the if you look at the elevations, which are down here, <coughs> the um, the building height varies, and so what we'll be looking at is the taller sections are actually above the roof. So that would be a good opportunity to do screening for the rooftop units in that area. As, as you know, we we have a desire to have all that covered, so it's not facing the, the roadways and everything. Correct. Um, 
one of the other questions has been design standards, and as far as you know, are, are you going to follow through with what expectations are from our point of view? The short answer to that is yes. Um, the, the longer answer is the fact that when I first became involved in this project with the applicant, one of the first long discussions I had with him was the fact that this project has a lot of history, that it has a lot of work that was done in order to set the standard. This is the last piece. We talked about that last, well, two years ago now, uh, when we went through the process that, you know, we're not going to fall short on that. Um, because there was a lot of effort that was put in, and the applicant is on board with that. So, yes, in short, and a little bit longer, yes, as well. Well, my, my personal comment on that is that if you follow through with phase two, as there's one, I'll, I'll, I'll be okay with that. And then finally, the last comment that uh, Jay made, and that is the material that's on the land now, what's going to happen with that, what <coughs> does the applicant want with that material? Does it want the materials there for a short period of time? Will it be removed? What's the story? Do you want to talk to that? Good evening. I'm Doug Richardson, Director of Development for Waterstone Retail. Um, the light poles themselves um, will be removed within the week. Um, they are surplus and we're having the site contractor take them away. Everything else has been removed from the site. The only thing that is still there is a two-piece concrete vault, and it's for the main electric that comes under the road from Red Robin. It went off to the east to come around the back of Bob's to service the large building, and there's a little spur that will go over to the, to the west to service this building. Um, they're very large pieces. We ordered them all at the same time. They require a crane, so we respectfully request that we could leave them there, and if they are uh, any issue visually, I could put a small fence around it with some uh, screening if that was desired. But our intent on this is uh, for a summer of this year uh, start for construction. <coughs> that was my next question. Is there something that we have to, uh, Jay, decide, or is that something you're comfortable with and Dan? No, I think if we come up, um, if the board has comes up with a general comfort level, then what we can do is work with the applicant. We're currently holding a performance guarantee for some other set elements, and so long as we have an understanding of the board's expectations, i.e., you're okay with it staying, provided construction starts within six months or whatever the case may be, then we know what the expectations <coughs> are. The developer knows what the expectations are and then we'll be able to handle it as an administrative item. And I don't believe it, it doesn't really fall into our site plan review component, but it is something different than what the board had approved. So typically, as I had mentioned, what I told the uh, developer previously, that it, the expectation is that that be removed. But again, understanding where we're at in the process, it made sense to allow the conversation to occur with the board since they were coming forward um, in a timely manner, it, you know, without wanting to, you know, try to be accommodating where, where it makes sense, and this seems to be a spot that may make some sense. Well, I'm, I'm, I'll be content if, if, as was just stated, that they expect this summer, then uh, I have no problem with that. Uh, there's no need to create extra expense, especially where they, they, they have held their word, to the best of my knowledge, right along the line, so I have no problem with that at all. Thank you. Thank you. And in regards to your comments on design elements for phase two, uh, phase one, we use the exact light fixtures that were out on the roadway. We use the exact manufacturer of the masonry that's both on the Lowe's and the Walmart, and those same design elements will be carried over into the phase two. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, my last, it's a question, and it may be too premature to answer, but are the initial tenants in phase one happy with the situation, as far as you know? I think the initial tenants in phase one are very happy to be where they are. Um, they are doing quite well, um, and I haven't heard any negative feedback about a phase two building. Uh, they obviously came in knowing that there was going to be a, a build out there. I, I think that the whole project uh, is uh, a welcome addition to the town of Scarborough, and I know that uh, 
prior to the opening of the two latest adventures, I got at least 10 phone calls as to when you were going to open. So I think that's a good sign. That's, a, that's all, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ron. Mike? Kudos to that planning board. It was originally approved. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the tenants must be. I, I, I know there's a lot of interest because I noticed for the first time driving um, towards the mall, I don't know what direction and compass it is, on Payne Road, cars are actually impacting Payne Road, waiting to queue into gallery. So we'll have to pay attention to that. Hopefully that was just out of the uh, initial interest of the grand openings, et cetera. If you saw that last week, I did. Um, that was the grand opening. There was uh, quite, quite a bit of activity. Right more so than I think you would expect normally. I would, yeah, I would think so. so yeah. but just, just to, you know, note, because we have a situation, I, I, I doubt it'll continue, but um, we have a situation on Route 1 with a coffee shop that queues into Route 1 occasionally, still, to this day. I saw that not too many weeks ago also. So, uh, yeah, they're, uh, they're doing well with everything. Uh, and it's a much better parking lot, I would imagine, than what Clark's Pond offered. <laughs> in condition, anyway. Um, th th we don't have a picture, I guess, of this, what do you call it, electrical vault that we're talking about, this concrete? Um, I don't have a photo with me tonight, no. But it, it's an element of, a, of construction, is it not? It, it's, a, it, it's, it's an item that is typically used to enhance or aid in the construction of a um, It goes property. underground. Oh, um, and, then, and then it disappears, if you Correct. Know. Yeah, okay. So I have no problem, of course, with the applicant stating that their intention is to begin construction in the summer. I would imagine that, the, that what it is six months might be a length of time before things are tidied up and they're open for business, et cetera. Yes. Um, so I don't have anything to add. I mean, uh, again, like my colleague states, I'm not going to get involved in stormwater because I'll just make a fool of myself and waste everyone's time. <clears throat> but um, over the many years that I've served on the planning board, uh, I've never been um, uh, led astray by the engineers and Alice's and others, so, and certainly not from yourself, also Nancy. You're very thorough, so I'm sure it all works, and if it doesn't, I'm sure others that are more schooled in that area, uh, that science, uh, will, uh, will keep you on task. Um, I, like you stated, having a building close to the road, which I'm generally in favor of, especially attractive buildings such as this. I imagine, like the applicant stated, this is going to follow the same architecture that we've seen throughout the, uh, throughout the project across all phases. But it, will, it does require some um, creativity as far as shielding the utilities. Correct. And um, the dumpster areas, et cetera. Now, I just see uh, the layout as you've drawn for the dumpster area, and it looks like if we look at it, to the right of the building, it looks like there's almost like two areas that are fenced in. Is that on purpose? There are, yeah. And what's the purpose of two areas? In the retail space, there may be more than one tenant. And so uh -huh. as part of that, they wanted to be able to have some segregated space for them. It may be a situation where that gets consolidated into one. As we work closer with the architect, we'll refine that. I see. Okay. And on the left side, it, it's, it's one area. That would be on the restaurant side. On the restaurant side. And that leads me to my final um, uh, comment uh, on this rendition. Um, I, I erroneously thought it was going to be, when I think of two buildings into one, and I, think that I thought of two tenants. But that's not necessarily the case. Did it looks like it could be, from what I'm hearing, could be three tenants. Or four. Or four. Hence the... Uh, the, the layout would suggest where the signs might be. Correct. When you get to a 50-foot depth building, you tend to have, in the retail side, smaller space tenants. So you, you end up you know, with more individual tenants in a relatively small span. Okay. Now, if it, if it does end up maturing into four tenants, if you will, or even three, uh, the front of the building is, if I call gallery the front, uh, it looks like there's maybe not a requisite number of ways to access the potential front doors, if you will, or am I not seeing that? 
the view, if you will, on the, the Scarborough Gallery side of the building uh, would be window treatments. They may be false windows. Okay. And the doors that are there are service doors. It would be for a common area for, like, um, the utility room, that type of thing. So the customer access is actually inward of the site. So people parking and coming into the to the entry doors for the individual spaces would come in on the uh, what would be the southerly side of All the right, building. So what I should do is I should pay attention to what you've given me. The storefront elevation is actually from the parking lot side. Correct. And then there's the street view elevation, which shows what you just described. Correct. I see. Okay. Very good. Um, so tonight uh, we're just having a discussion per se, and you'll be coming back with further details. I'd like to get your feedback, anything that you would like us to add as part of that. Mm -hmm. If you recall from uh, the last time we did the review for the overall uh, layout, we, had, we kind of broke it into two parts. So we had the site-specific items that we talked with you folks about, and then we had the architectural presentation that talked about building materials and colors and samples and things like that. So we envision that the, the next time we come back to you, that the, the rendering that shows the view of the site, discussion about architectural materials, samples, that type of thing. That will be the primary focus of that, but we wanted to get sort of the site items out of the way. Uh, so if there's anything else that you folks would like to have us provide, we could do that and, and sort of bring things to closure next time. So as we access the dumpster area for service to empty, um, it looks like it might impact the, uh, the pedestrian way. <coughs> at least maybe to the right of the building, or am I just not appreciating the scale? There's a, there is a crosswalk there. Okay. Um, we don't expect that these would happen, obviously, more than maybe right. once a week. Okay. I guess I'm going to, when you come back, I'd be, as others have said, I believe, I'd appreciate more of a uh, kind of a, um, a street view, if you will, of what how these elements are going to look, because um, I think the development over the last 10 years has, de has uh, matured quite nicely, and obviously the applicant's going to follow those, uh, those same um, goals and cues, but um, I just want to see how this building really feels from the, from the crosswalk, if you will, how the dumpster enclosures look, how maybe the enclosures will match with the building, if you will. Mm -hmm. It won't be just maybe a chain link with you know, some exactly. kind of slats through it, that kind of thing. But other than that, and, and how the uh, HVAC systems will be shielded from view. But uh, everything else seems fine, and uh, appreciate seeing you, seeing you come back and seeing it le next time. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Right. Chairman. Problem? Uh, thanks. Uh, so just talking about the housekeeping with the uh, utility vault. Uh, are both pieces, are they, how close are they together, or are they turned back to back so that it's not a confined space entry issue? Okay. Yeah, so I'd be fine with keeping it. So go ahead, Corey. Yeah, so would you mind just, uh, since you have the mic, <laughs> would you mind just kind of paraphrasing what he said? I don't sure. know if you heard. I, I don't want to make him come all the way up, but I want to make sure <laughs> it's, it's on the record. To, to answer Robin's question, um, the two units are near each other. They're on their sides so that they're not pro uh, providing a confined space. They are situated so that they do not collect rainwater as well. Um, and they are located generally in this area here, if I recall correctly. Thank you. So I would be fine with them staying there. Um, it might be worth just a fire department guy or something going by, making sure that there's no public safety issue. But I'm fine with them staying there if it's a construction issue. Um, so, and thank you for clarifying for my colleagues that we will um, be able to see you again um, as far as the um, traffic analysis is concerned. So, will you provide that to staff when it's available, Nancy, or we will. as part of your next phase to the board, probably? We will be providing it for staff review prior to the uh, materials being filed. Excellent. Okay. And um, I only have two questions with respect to stormwater because you did such a good job. <laughs> <laughs> Are you thinking about um, considering a different um, pipe size? The 24-inch seems to be oversized. Um, the 24-inch actually ties into the larger drainage system that okay. comes down. So a couple of things are happening. One is 
that pipe system is picking up from this portion of the larger paved areas. It comes down through and ties in. Okay. And then this wet pond functions as a typical detention pond, so it has a 210 and 25 year water surface elevation, a spillway, yep. all that. We purposely upsized these pipes because I wanted to have just a little bit extra capacity there. Yep. So yes, they are a little bit bigger than you would normally think in a okay. sized parking area, but there was a reason behind it. Okay. I knew there would be. And so the, the wet pond brings me to my second question, mm -hmm. which is, I know this has been part of a larger master plan and economic development overlay, and a lot of work and time has gone into this, but um, I'm just, I have one question, and it's not, it may be for you, it may be for staff, but just something I think to move forward on kind of a thing, Nancy, is I know that you, were, you said you were, it was originally permitted in 2005. Right. Dave Sinas, in his comments from Woodard and Curran, Reference that an amendment happened in 2009. Around 2009, the town also adopted the post construction stormwater ordinance, mm -hmm. which requires post construction maintenance of said wet pond. So I would just ask because this is part of a larger common plan of development that the staff consider and, and you consider and talk about this how the, the maintenance and, uh, gets, gets handled moving forward, <coughs> post-construction, you know, like long-term maintenance, right. like annual reports to the town and the like, Nancy. Right. And we will we work closely with the town on that because part of the flow that, it, it, it's a little complex yep. um, because part of the flow that comes down through and goes into that pond is from the public road. <laughs> so we'll have so to... So you need to talk to the town <laughs> about it. <laughs> so we'll coordinate with Angela and Good. the public works director as well. Yeah. And so there's a long history of dates there, but I know you guys will crack that nut and we'll look forward to talking about it later. Um, one of the, my final comments, Nancy, is has to do with um, uh, grease, fats, oils, and grease. Um, will there be maybe an oils and grease dumpster on site, outside storage type of thing? Um, because I noticed that there's a grease trap um, uh, cited in here and staff comments and the like. and. The, the coordination with the sanitary uh, district is, is required, but mm -hmm. it, it can also be a waste, waste management type type issue as well to keep in mind and uh, with respect to stormwater and illicit discharges in this area. Um, to answer part of that question, uh, back when we went through the original review, we met with the Scarborough Sanitary District and there was a restaurant on the plan at that time. So um, as far as the, the requirements for a sampling manhole, for a grease trap, those types of things, we went through that um, with that. So when we provided this new plan, we tried to carry over sort of the feedback that we'd gotten from, from those folks uh, with regard to that. As far as um, whether there would be any um, sort of um, containers, if you will, in the dumpster area, I, th I think we can coordinate with, with okay. Doug on that to, to okay. provide perhaps some information for you on that. But typically what I've seen is that that's um, you know, handled through, you know, a, a smaller container that's in the dumpster area. And mm -hmm. certainly you've seen all the effort that the applicant has put into, you know, making this site a signature location. We certainly don't want to have an eyesore at the front. Yep. So, you know, the applicant, their maintenance people, um, are very active on this site, that would be, you know, a key thing that they would be working with as well. They want to make sure that all of their tenants are happy and if you've got, you know, something that's affecting the view, yep. then that's not good for all the tenants. Excellent. And then a question just for my own is, is the sanitation district considered part of staff comments? Do you coordinate with the sanitation district at all? Yep, so the sanitary okay. director comes to our inner department Great. meeting. Um, so yes, their comments are generally reflected in our comments. Excellent. So if they need any follow-up, they can speak up after seeing. Correct. And so, so um, they also re they get as part of any reviewed, uh, I'm sorry, uh, revised submissions, they'll have an opportunity to review those and provide comments, and those are made as part of this process. Great. Excellent work, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, just because I was going over notes, uh, I think we should have public record a couple of the comments that uh, staff has made. One is on the roof drain connections. Yes. That was not clear on that. Yes. Um, on this plan here, you can see there's a line that comes from the building right here that ties into that catch basin that makes the connection from the discharge on Gallery Boulevard and then goes down and out. So this building has what's called the roof drip line BMP. So the runoff from the roof will actually sheet into an open area at the ground level. 
it will filter down and have an under drain underneath it and that pipe is what ties in from that area there. I talked to the applicant about if you look um, the building heights vary and so on the side the lower height components if you will of the building would be at the roof level so that would be the opportunity where it would be able to sheet down in uh, and get into that roof drip line BMP that would provide the treatment. It's primarily thermal treatment that's offered as part of that uh, and that would allow it to tie into that system and then go down through. I'll defer it to the town engineer on, on that. And then the last thing is uh, we didn't discuss lighting at all by anybody. An oversight on my part. Um, as part of our next presentation, one of the comments that was made was a question about some hot spots um, and some darker areas. So we'll review that with the landscape architect and the lighting supplier who provided the photometrics so that when we do come back before you folks, we'll have either balanced it out or have some modifications for you on that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to just have a public thank you. Well, thank you for, um, again, for a thorough overview. Um, and there's <laughs> really nothing good left for me to pick at, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I guess to just get one thing out of the way, I'm, I'm fine with, uh, with leaving the, the vault in place um, in the way it's positioned and assuming that it'll be starting this summer and it can always be revisited if things change for whatever reason. Um, I look forward to seeing the, uh, the uh, architectural renderings and other architectural detail next time along with the, the traffic study, uh, updated traffic study. Um, along with the, the architectural detail, obviously, will be some screening, uh, some screening detail as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I just like to congratulate the applicant on what's there, what's been done there so far. And um, as you said, Nancy, I think there's clearly a commitment to maintaining that high standard. So I think between that and and uh, staff, <coughs> uh, confident that continue to move in the right direction, and and uh, we'll look forward to seeing the next iteration. Thank you very much. Right. Any, anything more, any other feedback from us at this point? I think we're all set. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, it is 9.30 and uh, some of us, we have actually had a workshop before this, this uh, meeting. I've been at this now for three and a half hours or so. I'm going to propose we take just a really quick break, uh, four or five minutes, and then we'll come back and finish. We've got three more uh, applicants on the agenda. I will note that um, the board cannot take up any new items after 10.30. As is stated on the agenda, we will do our absolute best to uh, move through things as efficiently as we can, but I just wanted to put that heads up and, or a reminder out there, and we will take a quick break. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks, Jay. And I'll hand it off to the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Bushy with uh, Stantec. Haven't been before you folks for a little while, and so just a 15 second uh, to let you know. My firm uh, used to be DeLuca Hoffman Associates, was acquired by Face Buffer and Thorndike a few years back and have now uh, been acquired by a firm Stantec. And so I'm actually now a, a, uh, an employee with a uh, residence now in Scarborough. Uh, my office, which was formerly in South Portland, uh, just moved this past weekend, in fact, to the uh, Payne Road uh, Stantec office here. So uh, happy to be here in, in Scarborough. So I'm here uh, before you. Uh, on behalf of 25 Wash LLC, uh, Mr. Jesse Abbott is here with a family member, and Mr. Abbott is a uh, longtime property owner, uh, business person here in the community, and uh, manages a number of properties and so forth. So he has uh, taken ownership of the 25 Washington Avenue uh, building, which houses Allen Screen Printing. I don't know how long they've been there, but I suspect it's been quite a period of time that they've been in that building. Building, uh, just for general location, uh, on the corner, it was lot four of the original industrial park. And uh, for familiarity, you have main indoor carting, which is just to the north or east of it. Public Works Department is also. So this is on the really far end of the business park as you come in off of Lincoln or Route 1, uh, kind of somewhat removed from, from uh, everything. Uh, the business has been uh, very good for that building, and the folks uh, there, they have a fair amount of a number of uh, employees, and in fact, they've been uh, taking advantage of uh, a uh, good relationship with Maine Indoor Karting and using their parking lot, in fact, uh, to park a lot of their uh, vehicles. So uh, with the new ownership of Mr. Abbott, uh, he's seeking to have a parking lot expansion to provide just some greater capacity so they're not parking over on the main indoor carting property. Uh, as Jay has outlined, the expansion is just to this side of uh, the existing building. So it's roughly a 20,000 square foot building here on the corner. I'll get to the addition that we've uh, shown on the plans here in a moment, but the uh, main part of the project proposal is the uh, 34 space parking area here. We have 21 spaces out in the front of the property with a main entrance today that uh, not only allows access into the two little parking areas on either side, but there's multiple loading dock configuration here, so uh, vehicles from Washington just simply back into these loading spaces, and that's kind of the important piece that we'll talk about in a minute uh, with respect to the, the access into the uh, parking lot. I'll note uh, that the property originally had a boundary, I'm kind of outlining it right here, and there was a right-of-way that, in fact, I understand the town owned uh, where the sanitary sewer was. And uh, a previous landowner negotiated with the town a while back for the acquisition of that land, maintaining an easement for the sewer use, uh, but the town was agreeable. Uh, it must have been just the idea back in the 80s or even late 70s when this original subdivision, uh, this was the Greater Portland Building Fund subdivision, uh, they had decided that the town was going to maintain ownership of the easement areas for the utilities. And I think at some point in time, the town probably thought, well, we only need an easement for that. We might as well put that back on the tax rolls effectively by selling the land to one of the abutting landowners. And I believe, don't know that, all the circumstances, but I'm conjecturing here that that was what happened here, that the landowners, geez, I'd like to have that additional land. It's just a right-of-way. We're not going to impact uh, the sewer line that goes through it which only benefits uh, another property or so. So uh, that all then allowed this property to be increased in size uh, over time. Now, to build this parking lot area, uh, an additional roughly quarter of an acre of land currently on lot seven of the business park, which is the main indoor carting area. And that main indoor carting property, I believe, is a little over seven acres or so. So it's a pretty good size uh, parcel already in itself. And uh, they basically can allow or sell this piece of property without any uh, negative impact relative to zoning compliance and so forth for their property being the size and what they have for, for use. So that has been uh, uh, negotiated. We've just recently provided you some evidence uh, of the agreement between the two parties uh, to have main indoor carting sell this strip of land here that would effectively allow fairly traditional parking lot uh, configuration here. 
uh, with traditional parking spaces and so forth to be built on you know this side of the building. We chose to put the uh, driveway here off of Washington simply to avoid uh, if we put a driveway and swept it around here and came out this way, we'd have that much more traffic uh, with the potential conflict with the loading docks and uh, the vehicles that are using those uh, dock areas. As Mr. Bray has pointed out, uh, no significant issue relative to sight lines based on the traffic volume that uses Washington uh, Avenue today, which is fairly modest. Uh, this driveway configuration we felt was, was certainly appropriate, uh, despite the fact that, yes, we have one existing driveway here. We would have two effectively serving this property, but uh, that's our proposal. We think it's the, the neatest and cleanest in terms of access for uh, this, this parking lot area. A few of the staff comments uh, that we've uh, heard about include snow storage, and we'll provide uh, on uh, a plan. <coughs> snow storage would probably be up in these corners here. We're certainly aware of the idea that we want to avoid placement of snow in a couple of uh, stormwater management areas here that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, we have a sidewalk access along this side that would allow anybody parking in this area. Currently, the main doors over in this zone here, so they'd be able to walk over, walk through the parking lot, and have access to the building. This 2,600 square foot building addition here currently is really envisioned uh, as a future building piece, and it would be for just additional storage uh, within the building. I uh, don't know many other details. I'm not sure there are any other specific details to, the, uh, to that space, but we wanted to show it on the plan. It is uh, an ideal area to simply bump out the building to provide a little bit more uh, storage capacity within, within the building itself. That would bring it up a little over 21,000, uh, 22,000 square feet in uh, building space. We would have an entrance currently configured uh, on this side here off of the parking lot that could be subject to change as uh, this building space were to be really further and fully, more fully defined. So on the utilities, stormwater drainage side of things, pretty traditional parking lot split with a high spot down the middle of it, drainage coming off either side. So we've put in an underdrained soil filter in this little zone here, which today is just effectively a lawn area. Uh, there is a bit of a ditch that comes along Washington Avenue with the flow of water from basically this area making its way uh, along Washington Avenue. That ditch line flows beyond the Public Works Department, crosses under Washington Ave, and basically outlets towards, <laughs> I'll call it, the south side of uh, the Willowdale Golf Course. If you've been out to the golf course, the Eastern Trail is just there. There's a culvert crossing underneath the trail. It's very close to uh, tidal conditions related to uh, uh, Millbrook and, and the river in that area. So not a lot of infrastructure between this site and tidal conditions. So uh, the underdrained soil filters, though, certainly provide more important element of treating stormwater coming off of this parking lot area. Uh, they'll also, though, provide some degree of stormwater management uh, for detention control. We provided most recently, and staff probably has not had a great opportunity to review that. We just provided it last week to them, but we're hopeful that uh, we're going to show adequate evidence that if we have a, a good stormwater system. This isn't a very big parking lot area, and uh, by providing uh, those two little areas in here, we feel that we adequately meet the, uh, the standards for both the water quality treatment piece and the quantity control piece. Uh, given the consideration of ditch capacity and so forth uh, along, along the street, which is a, a town uh, issue. Uh, staff has made light of a couple of other items related to uh, lighting as an example. And lighting coverage today really is just with some building mounted lights. This is an industrial setting. Uh, really not many of the lots down there have much for pole lights or otherwise. I believe there is a uh, street light on the, uh, this side of the street. Uh, of Washington Avenue probably doesn't provide a great deal of coverage, but uh, we have said that uh, lighting would basically remain unchanged. We understand staff has uh, uh, perhaps a concern on that. We, we feel that uh, it doesn't need to really be too much to address lighting there, but if we have to uh, uh, discuss that further with staff, we certainly can do so. Uh, 
landscaping. Uh, there was a couple of comments made in regards to uh, perhaps the potential to do a little bit more in the landscaping. I'll note there's a couple of mature trees, deciduous trees out along the street side here. Fairly heavy cover of pine trees, mature pine trees, tall pine trees over on this side of the building. Not as much over in here, uh, nothing out in here today other than the fact that there is a stand of trees, some of which will be removed to construct the uh, parking lot here, but they will remain a little thinner buffer area between the site and the, the mainly carting uh, property. We had proposed simply a couple of pine trees in here. I'm not sure if it, uh, there, are, there are some trees and plantings, ground mount plantings up against the building here, uh, short evergreen trees and so forth, four or five feet tall, just provide a little breakup of that, that front face, but uh, that's what's out there today. We weren't proposing really much more uh, within the parking lot or otherwise, and uh, given the setting, the industrial area, not a lot of visibility from, from anywhere, certainly. Uh, we felt uh, that we were uh, okay in that regard, but certainly need to have your feedback from uh, the planning board's perspective. So that's uh, the gist of the, uh, the, uh, the project. One point that uh, Jay mentioned was the sanitary uh, line that extends off of Washington and goes up through that former right-of-way, but now is part of the, the parcel. Uh, and is an easement, so there's a 10-inch sanitary sewer that extends its way up and serves uh, at least the neighboring property here, the Glidden uh, uh, roofing property. I believe the district, who we have not uh, been able to uh, get in front of yet, but certainly have intentions to do so very quickly, had an issue with uh, the location of one of our underdrain pipes. This is just an underdrain soil filter system. We could certainly rearrange the layout of those piping. Uh, that piping system so that it wouldn't be over the sewer. So in the event, unlikely as it might be, that the sewer uh, district had to go in there and do something to the pipe, they wouldn't have to deal with uh, that uh, underdrain pipe. A little interesting because this is nothing more than just some granular material with, with topsoil and it's a filter. Yes, there's an underdrain and so forth to deal with, but Frankly, I, I would look at it as they'd have more of a chore in restoration of a surface, ultimately, if you had to do something with their sewer going up through the parking lot. But we know that we have sewer pipes underneath roads and parking lots all the time. Uh, certainly going to be more expensive from their side of things if they ever had to do something with that pipe, which, again, I would expect, frankly, not in our lifetimes, that there'll ever be an issue with having to replace that uh, that sewer line. It's not a very old line in the first place, built in the 80s um, from an infrastructure piece. And the tenant sewer, which is a little interesting, I think there must have been a contemplation that the uh, industrial park was going to have uh, quite a higher intensity use, ultimately, because a tenant sewer line is a pretty sizable line, and uh, frankly, that probably sees small percentage of the flow that it's designed for, I'm guessing, uh, but that's that's what's there. It's relatively deep, and uh, so we don't have any con conflict issues with any of our infrastructure. We're not doing any other uh, utility pieces for, the, for this parking lot or uh, the building piece. The building is served with uh, uh, water for both domestic and fire. It's got a sprinkler system. Uh, there is a sewer line, I think, Staff may have uh, made a comment about where where is the sewer line, and frankly, I, I need to find that out specifically where the existing sewer uh, and exit point is from the building. We can certainly show that on the plans. But uh, yes, there are some details that need to get worked out. Uh, I was hopeful, and at least making the case until you ask, you, you never know. But I was hopeful that if the uh, board felt reasonably comfortable that there was an opportunity to work through the final. Uh, details with staff, uh, but certainly understand if the board feels otherwise that uh, we'd have to come back, we could do that. But I'd, I'd like to make the plea uh, tonight just for the sake of uh, uh, expediency. They're interested in building this parking lot relatively uh, soon. Um, construction season is upon us in the uh, availability of getting contractors. Um, many of them are getting booked up pretty solid, and so here's a, a situation where we'd like to just get this parking lot built uh, relatively quickly. But that being said, we understand there are some details that need to get worked out, and we're going to work them out as quickly as we can. In fact, uh, this week is my, my goal, but here before you tonight to uh, hear any further comments or questions that you might have. 
with that, I throw it back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, this is another item where we do have the opportunity for public comment. And, uh, don't see any, so go to the board and Mike. Okay. I'll leave a few comments. <coughs> If uh, others wanted to work out the conditions that would be required, I, I don't ha I don't have any real energy behind uh, um, delaying any kind of approval per se. Um, but um, that being said, um, this plan does not show the sewer easement, does it? Is that true? Do I? S I'm looking for it. I don't see it. Uh, probably not. Okay. You're looking at the site plan. Yeah. Do you have the uh, survey plan, which would be the probably? I have, I have the original survey plan that yeah. shows it, but doesn't really, uh, it doesn't place it in context as to what you want to do here in the parking lot. Right. So, so that would be beneficial, I would think, to show show that sewer line <clears throat> and the extent of, you know, um, just to support all that you've said about, you know, its depth and how it won't impact any kind of a, uh, any of the construction that's related to this parking lot expansion. But, um, <clears throat> In my view, and I might be looking at it wrong, but it doesn't seem to me that uh, there's a lot of energy right now behind. We're not we're not really talking about the expansion of the building. That you're just showing that to us. And should you want to expand the building, I would presume you'd be back here. I, I think, uh, given the fact that there really aren't any design details, I think we wanted to show it and see what the temperature was of either staff and or the board. Uh, my sense is now I, I'm thinking you'd like to see something more defined as to that building piece, and I don't believe that that's as important of an element here as the parking lot is the uh, primary driver for any approvals that we're really seeking. Yeah, I would think so. So uh, I, I'll just concentrate on the parking lot. and. Uh, um, you say today to accommodate the demand of the building, they use part of the main door, uh, main indoor cart parking lot, and this would eliminate that need. Correct. So right there, uh, that's that's a huge improvement, I would think, because I don't certainly if you were before us with a uh, site plan that had, in part of its proposal, using another property's parking lot, it probably wouldn't get too far. Right. So this is good news. Um, the um, the fact that you have two two entrances to the lot does not concern me because of what you said. Uh, the truck loading area. Uh, if I was looking at this site plan without your new parking lot, and you were showing me the one way in and out right in front of a truck loading area, that would be. I don't think that would get too far either. So this is an improvement as well. So, um, um, but J, uh, for Jay, you s this is going to require a um, an amended subdivision plan. Also, is that correct? That is correct. And that's not uh, before us, is it? I didn't see a subdivision plan that sort of reference. No, we don't have a subdivision plan before us. Yeah, because you know you're acquiring property and you're changing the lot configuration, so. That that would be a, uh, an impediment to really finding me being in favor of making any approvals tonight because that's a big piece. Yeah, that w it was not a piece uh, that we were really keyed in on yeah. that there would need to, to be that. Uh, actually, surprised me a little bit because I went through the records. Uh, you just were asking about where that easement area was. So that ease the the line I'm kind of tracing it out here was just a 50 foot long wide strip right along this side of the parking lot. Uh, that was uh, sold by the town mm -hmm. to a previous owner of, of this property. Yeah. I don't, there's nothing in the records that say at the time that there was a, an amended subdivision plan, and I'm not sure there needed to be because we weren't well, adjusting. I'm not, really, I'm not really focused on that. Maybe I should be a little bit, but what, what I'm focused on is the fact is that um, a lot fours is uh, enlarging their lot by acquiring property that uh, currently belongs to lot seven. Right. So that in of itself requires a site, uh, a, a subdivision amendment. Um, so that being said, uh, it seems to me anyway, and I, I, I don't do your business certainly, and I, I would fail miserably at it. You guys work very hard, but it seems to me that the details that are, re are missing here, if you will, um, probably can be put together in time for you to be back in short order, possibly in our next meeting. And uh, I would think that once it's all tidied up, this is not really a complicated um, uh, effort on my part 
to uh, to move forward and, and give you approval because there's so many positive aspects of what you're doing here. So it's just getting through those details. But, Agreed. Uh, I applaud what you're doing. It's good. I'm, I'm glad that you're working well with Maine Indoor Karting and uh, you're able to move that lot. I'd like to see the easement certainly on, on your next trip back uh, superimposed over here just so I can get a sense that you've addressed the concerns of the district as far as moving maybe some of those trees that you've um, suggested to be planted. Sure. Um, as far as the expansion of the building go, I appreciate you showing it to us now, but if that's not really something that's in the immediate future, I would suggest you just leave it off. You know, lightly shaded, if you will, but it really doesn't have any real play, in my view, as to what's really before us. But uh, those are my comments, okay? And congratulations on uh, locating the Scarborough. Thank you, Mr. Jim. Thanks. Or if I might just to jump in on the on the building expansion piece, I just want to make it clear for for the board and, and the applicant that um, essentially the ordinance site plan ordinance talks about you know if you don't get a substantial start with the building expansion within a year, then that expires. So if it really isn't in your you know one year, maybe potentially two year time frame, then you know it, it either either you need to go through the effort of detailing it all in or if it is a bit longer term out, that coming back to the board for a site plan amendment to add a building that maybe has already been built into your stormwater consideration and parking considerations probably would be a relatively um, <coughs> straightforward site plan process. So just something to think about as you, you move forward with your detailing. Thanks, Jay. Ron? Yeah, uh, I just want to follow up. I respect what, what you said. Um, but I, I have a, an immediate concern. And I know we're talking just about the, uh, the parking lot. But if I understand you right now, without the expansion, the way employees get in is through the dock area? There's uh, entry doors just to the left side of the dock area. That, that concerns me if you're talking about trucks backing up and people walking. I mean, I. Uh, that, that's a concern. I would want to see a second entrance if we're going to build a parking lot where you have it. I'd want to see that expansion done because it, to me that's 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 a danger zone with people walking and trucks moving in the in the same general vicinity. I'd have to provide a little bit better information about what goes on in the building. Frankly, I don't know what that is, and Mr. Abbott wanted to talk about that. It may not be prepared to do that tonight, uh, but as far as the pattern, absent any building piece uh, expanding on this side. I know as for an example that there is a door on this side of the building, but it looks to be just a, as an exit door mm -hmm. uh, from the space. It's not used, uh, I'm not even sure it has a, uh, a concrete pad or anything, it's just an exit door. Uh, the primary entrances are on this area. If the concern relative to the access of people parking in here and walking across this area, we need to look at that as a how do we go about best doing that with the fact that, yes, there are uh, vehicles. Now, they're doing that today because there are people who are parking over on this side. I understand. So that doesn't make it right. I mean, I, I understand because I'll, I'll agree that the two uh, cuts are needed, one for where you employees are going to go in and one where your trucks are going to back into or drive into. I, I'm, I'm in full agreement with that, but I'm still back to concern of parking here and walking there. Uh, you know, it's a crapshoot in my mind. And uh, so, yeah, I need further clarification of that. And I'm not one that wants people to come back any, any time necessary, any more time than is necessary, but, but there are a lot of loose things here that, that need to be tied up before I can give uh, final approval. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, you, you mentioned storage, snow storage, but can you firm that up? Because you said probably will be, but I need that firmed up. Um, there was also a comment uh, about uh, the Oh, yeah, the sanitary district, and I understand what you said about the depth, but one of the comments that staff provided to us is that the sanitary district doesn't want any trees on that e easement either. 
okay, not only underground, but above ground. So that needs to be, uh, uh, and landscaping, um, you're taking the one tree down, I understand that, but uh, uh, I, I need clarification on what's going to be done to replace without going on the easement. Uh, so they're, they're just, like my colleagues see, things that just need to be tied up so that uh, we're comfortable uh, with uh, giving final approval. And then and going back to the parking spaces itself, uh, I didn't see where there was handicap anywhere uh, spaces provided. There are. Okay, I missed that. I'm sorry. Um, and as far as stormwater, that's something I, I think you need to work out with staff too. I don't think that they've got their final comfort level with stormwater either, uh, including management. You mentioned the lighting. Um, and I think that's about it from my point of view. Again, just to repeat, tying up some of these loose ends so that the next time you come in is a full picture, we're comfortable, and we can make a final you know, decision. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rob. Robin? Come on. Thanks, Corey. Um, Steve, I must have missed the comment that you made about the, the depth below ground of the, of the um, sewer main. Sewer main? Yeah. How, how much do we anticipate it being? I believe it's like six and a half to seven feet down. Really? That far? Yeah. Okay. Got it. Because I was thinking, okay. Um, we're kind of on the tail end of it because it goes up, okay. rising up, so we're on the deeper Got end it. of it as okay. it's tying back into Washington. Perfect. Um, snow storage, um, will uh, you have any way to uh, protect the underdrain soil filters at the mouth of the road there to make sure that um, snow doesn't end up on top of the underdrain soil filters? I'll have to give that a little bit of consideration sure. what we might do there okay. uh, to avoid that. I think ideally, just <laughs> the way the parking lot's situated here, that uh, pushing that snow up into these corners seems to be okay. probably the, the more ideal as opposed to just coming in and trying to push it back down sure. this way. So the plow guys don't always get it, though, so it's, it's connecting the dots there. Uh, are you seeking a light waiver, a lighting waiver? We would be, yes. You would, okay. Um, uh, I, w I also want to echo what my colleague said about safety. I would have some safety concerns about the pedestrian crossings near the truck crossings kind of a thing. Um, I'm also wondering about the parcel um, that you're sort of cutting into here, and I understand main carting probably was um, redeveloped fairly recently, since, since 2010, 2007 kind of a thing. So I'm wondering if we know if that forested stand there that will probably be cleared is part of a stormwater BMP for your, for your uh, neighbor. So I think it's important that we look to their permit to see whether or not that stand of trees was considered um, a forested buffer. Um, again, I just uh, echo what my colleague said about um, you know a few more loose ends to tie up, but I won't take up any more time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I don't think I have anything new to add really. Um, just basically amplify what's been said about um, loose ends to tie up. Um, we need to see, the, see the, uh, the easement on the plan, get some clarification on stormwater, um, some more detail just on sort of building and uh, the operations so we have a better understanding of, of uh, the, the circulation at the site in terms of not only vehicles but pedestrians as well. Um, and uh, I guess I would leave it in, in your court or the applicant's court as to sort of, given what you've heard tonight about um, the level of detail that, that we'll want to see um, the site in general as to whether you feel the need to proceed to flesh out the building addition a little bit more. Um, I think, you know, in, in one sense it's, it's a little bit of a judgment call in terms of how urgent the perceived need is for the, the additional parking. Um, on the one hand, it might streamline things if you just focused on the parking, but then again, there could be questions about pedestrian safety and 
other things that could tie into a potential building expansion. So um, I guess, yeah, again, we'll try to solve all those problems tonight, but um, leave that to you uh, with your client and staff to sort of work through that and figure out what, what the best strategy is. But I think um, hopefully you've heard that you know, from the board, we're not, we're not interested certainly in kind of arbitrarily dragging things out. And I think we and the staff are more than happy to work with you to, to get to a good outcome uh, as quickly as, as reasonably possible. Um, just want to quickly look over things to make sure I'm not uh, not missing anything. Um, oh, there was a question about a request for a waiver of a lighting plan. Um, there's also a note in staff comments about request for a waiver of a landscaping plan. Um, and I guess there was a there were a couple general landscaping comments. You know, given given the location and the zoning classification, I don't personally see the need for a full-fledged landscape plan, but I think that, that I'd file that under something that um, mm -hmm. I think we'd like to see some more detail on. And I think it's been mentioned in the course of other comments, talking about trees and screening and things like that. Um, you could just sort of incorporate that into your, your overall submission next time. Uh, but I don't think we need necessarily a full-fledged landscape plan per se. So. Like I said earlier, I think many of the uh, comments are relatively easily addressable. Uh, the comment, probably the most important piece that we've heard tonight was that uh, connectivity and the pedestrian safety piece uh, probably bears the most thought in terms of how we might address that particularly without a, a building expansion there. But I think there are ways certainly to address it. Uh, commonly uh, signage, uh, some pavement surface uh, type treatments, things that uh, from the owner's perspective need to be efficient, i.e. low cost, uh, maintainable, and so forth, yet also achieve an objective of just making it safe for somebody to be able to walk from this area, considering, yes, there will be more people since there's 34 spaces over here, how we best go about doing that. So I think maybe if I learn a little bit more about uh, where some of the doors are and so forth, uh, I can come up with uh, a pretty good strategy there, and I'm glad it was a very thoughtful, good comment here from the, the board tonight about that. So we will address it. Great. Good luck. We'll look forward to seeing it next time. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our goal, Mr. Chairman, uh, my goal will be to respond very quickly here this week uh, with the hope and expectation of looking at the, the planning board schedule. And I know you have other projects, so uh, I'll leave that to staff to figure that out. But our goal was to hopefully be on the 1st of April uh, meeting, given what we've heard tonight. And so I'm going to try to Great. get everything in as quickly as I can. Great. Well, hopefully we'll see you on there. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Item number nine, ABCO Rental and Storage, Inc. requests a site plan amendment review for, for 95 Pleasant Hill Road, Assessor's Map, R78, Lot 84, is that Lot 84A? Uh, yes. 84A, 84A yes. and 85. Just wanted to make sure I read that right. Introduce this one, Jay. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. So this is a applicant. The applicant is seeking to add a roughly 3,200 square foot building to an existing site off of Pleasant Hill Road. Uh, this site is also in the industrial district, as we had just uh, previously reviewed. Um, so although the proposed development seems to be generally consistent with the allowed type of activities with the industrial district, it does require site plan review, um, given the building addition and site work that are being proposed. Um, this application, somewhat similar to the other applications, staff felt that there's some additional details that would be warranted before it would be in a position uh, for for um, final board action, but we'll certainly defer to the board on, on that discussion. Um, particularly, so you'll receive staff comments from planning and, and uh, other department staff under planners' comments, as well as from Woodard and Kern, our peer review engineer. A um, couple of items that I've flagged I'll just highlight in terms of uh, traffic, uh, the applicants <coughs> indicated in their application that there's um, not anticipate, anticipated to be any significant increase from the site. Um, however, we'd just like to understand um, how that sort of works when you're adding a 3,200 square foot building. Um, 
that also gets to some of the, uh, pr the prior comment by staff that the existing site conditions, um, that plan wasn't fully developed, so it's really hard for staff and the board to have a sense of what is currently happening on the site, so we'd like to have a little more history on that. Um, so again, uh, a number of our comments really flagged a number of the details that we felt were lacking for boards to be able to make final action, but certainly um, I think we can make some progress tonight uh, moving the project forward. Um, I think, you know, as, as we discussed previously, um, uh, there, there's some staff comments with regards to lighting and the expectations therein, as well as landscaping. Uh, the sanitary district also weighed in on this element that it appears that the proposal will uh, have a realignment of an existing trunk line through the site, and the sanitary district will need to approve that activity. They um, weren't aware of that and would like some more details about that. Um, so at this point, as I said, um, you know, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, but we feel there are some additional details, but that we certainly could probably make some good progress tonight um, for discussion. Thanks, Jay. And I'll uh, it back to Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Bushy again with Stantec. With me here tonight is uh, Mark Sanborn from uh, Abco uh, Rental. Uh, Abco is another property owner, uh, owned multiple properties here in Scarborough, have for uh, quite a period of time, and uh, are well known uh, landlord and uh, land holder here in, in the community. So uh, certainly I will agree right off the front here that uh, on this project uh, there are many details that need to be worked out and we're in the process of working through those. So uh, I understand that, appreciate the staff's comments and uh, we have some more work to do and uh, hopeful tonight uh, simply to get uh, through uh, whatever the board uh, might feel as some primary things after I go through a little brief presentation here. So uh, we're ready to move through those things. So the site, 29 acres off of uh, Pleasant Hill Road, <coughs> just before you get to the uh, the overpass over the uh, the rail track. So as you come in from Route 1, it would be on the right-hand side, and uh, Pine Tree Waste uh, occupies this area, and they share a, an access point here onto uh, uh, Pleasant Hill Road. Pleasant Hill Road was improved by the town last year. You know, we had a water main uh, extension or renewal project that the water district did, and then the town also did a widening of Pleasant Hill Road out in front. So it's all nice and new and sparkly, and I think Pleasant Hill Road is really uh, working out very well relative to the town's uh, spending some money to improve that road. We went there with the idea of trying to improve it with shoulders for bicyclists and, and so forth, and I, I feel like uh, we achieved a certain number of uh, objectives with uh, the improvements there. I do know as well that the town uh, continues to probably go through the process of uh, uh, the extension of the Eastern Trail and, and so forth. So the, here's a landowner that has been uh, part of those discussions, uh, as I understand it, but that's not anything uh, certainly we're going to look at tonight. But this land uh, holder uh, sees a need. There's a need for uh, industrial space, particularly small uh, space. I've used the term, and the realtors have used this term a lot with me, about incubator space, small businesses, uh, guys might be one or two or three people, and they just need a, a, a space of 23, 25, 28, 3,000 square feet. They want a little office, 400, 500, 600 feet, place with a phone, internet connection, then they have a warehouse. So they might be an electrician, they might be a landscaper, they might be a plumber. Uh, there's demand out there in, in uh, so they're seeing a, a need here, and they'd like to be able to build this uh, standard building. Their property is pretty well hidden from Pleasant Hill Road. You know, there's vegetation and pretty mature screening here along Pleasant Hill Road. The primary view that you see from the street is, is uh, the folks over here. You don't see as much other than the sign, and there's a landscaping company now that occupies the, the front area, as does APCO. They use a, a building out there, APCO Rental, as they're using this space. There's another contractor, Williams Earth uh, Works, that uh, uses the, the land uh, for storing some equipment and materials and, and so forth, but you don't really ever see that from uh, Pleasant Hill Road, so that's probably a, a unique piece, certainly, in its setting with the industrial side of things. Um, so. Their proposal uh, on the property, there's existing buildings here, there's yard area out here interspaced uh, amongst some trees and so forth. They are interested in building this 
what would be a three-phase building area here. So the first phase would have four units with a total, and incorrectly identified on a plan, but the total would be about 11,700 square feet. They're envisioning this is a standard metal type building, slab on grade construction, single story uh, with a roof pitch from uh, front to back. But these spaces would be broken up in basically 30 foot wide modules, except for in this first area, one 40 foot wide module here, which it actually would be occupied by uh, the owner, uh, APCO Rental. So they'd have a 40 by 90 unit, then there would be three additional 30 by 90 units. So uh, providing space, a man door at the front of the building, overhead door at the back, and that's why we've provided ourselves a little bit of pavement, but basically just yard space. They could come in with a small truck or whatever and unload, load out of the overhead doors in, in the, each one of their spaces. So their goal is to simply build the first four units here as one module of a standard metal style building. Uh, then given enough tem tenant demand and interest, they'd add a second module here. Once that got fully leased out, build a third module so that we'd have that full little over 30,000 square foot building with uh, as many as 12 units here. So that's the proposal. They're hopeful that they'll see uh, great demand. They believe based on uh, what they hear from the real estate community that there will be uh, demand for the, this type of space. So uh, they're excited about that prospect. Our design includes just a paved access. And there's pavement today that comes into the site uh, roughly into this zone here. There's a building here couple of uh, fabric style buildings that are used basically as just garages, warehouse uh, uh, functions. There's outside storage of some landscaping because of the landscaping company that's out there. Uh, they have some topsoil and some mulch and a little backhoe that they use back and forth and bring to their sites, but just store it out here. Uh, we would extend the pavement out to uh, kind of a traditional parking lot area. I know one of the staff comments with, was uh, with respect to the amount of parking, and we had identified this as kind of double loaded, but we didn't really show very well the idea that there could be parking. This is wide enough here, so parking on this side, parking on this side. Uh, frankly, we don't foresee that this type of building use is going to need all of this parking, but uh, we want to have pavement out in front of these spaces, so we might as well make parking for it. Uh, the idea of having a separate drive here with a little bit of a looping effect is also something that APCO is, is seeking. They just think that that will be more convenient for the types of users and tenants that they're envisioning uh, rather than having, uh, you know, kind of a dead end. Uh, that just allows that looping function to drive in and drive out. A lot of times these small contractors, they're hauling a trailer around and it's easier for them to go in a loop rather than having to back up at any time to uh, change direction. We have a uh, water main extension. Uh, when we did the water renewal project last uh, summer, did install a fire service that's currently stubbed out that will be brought in so we have uh, hydrant and sprinkler service into the building. Domestic water already comes into the site today that will be extended. As Jay mentioned, sanitary sewer crosses the site now from uh, the direction of the tracks, goes through and it's in our building space and then cuts over and then back over in this direction. Uh, not really sure how that had ever transpired of the alignment of this. It's a little odd that it goes through the middle of the, the property, uh, but fortunately enough, we can change direction and basically just flip this. It's going to be nearly the same pipe length. We just have to install it at a different location. We can install a, a manhole here, come along the back, let's say, uh, side of the uh, property, and then tie back into that line. That way that frees up this building space here. Yes, we have to get uh, approval from the sanitary district and we're uh, moving on that now. We'll be in discussions and presumably before we come back to you next time, we'll have that in place. Uh, this is a fairly straightforward, somewhat deeper uh, sanitary sewer. Uh, in fact, it's about 10 feet down in the ground, but uh, we can do that construction easily enough. Uh, so we have a detention pond here that we'd like to do some modest retrofits to bring it up to, to standards and uh, achieve our water quality goals for stormwater. We uh, have read the staff comments. Uh, we need to do a little bit more design uh, work to uh, give it more detail about how we're going to collect stormwater from the 
area here and bring it into the pond, but uh, one of the things that we're looking at with a pond is we put in a filter bench, which is kind of a standard BMP with a pond for uh, filtering uh, the stormwater runoff, then it would discharge. It's interesting, there is a basin here uh, on this property, but the site basically abuts up to the Nonsuch River, and the Nonsuch River uh, at this location is tidal influence, so we really don't have any uh, issues relative to uh, flood control because we're in a t discharging to a tidal condition, which is somewhat unique given uh, how far away we are from the true ocean, but the Nonsuch up till the Route 1 bridge is everybody probably knows is tidally influenced. So um, we're in good shape in that regard, but we'll provide greater detail as to this basin as to what we're going to do there and hopefully address some of the staff comments about uh, the drainage provisions. So uh, also have heard lighting and a few other things. I think we need to provide greater detail. We'll provide a photometrics plan uh, in our next submission that will show you the lighting coverage. There's a couple of pole mounts out there now. I need to get a little bit better detail myself as to what those uh, poles are, are providing for coverage, uh, but we would look to have any new lighting be standard uh, cutoff type pictures and so forth, and uh, we'll uh, provide that on uh, the next piece. I also want to provide a, a phasing plan because uh, the proposal is to build this first building piece. Uh, we'll provide you a, a, a phasing plan that will show how that will get built out and uh, the degree of asphalt and so forth that will go with this first phase. Uh, but ultimately, we're going to be seeking approval for the entire development, just that they will only be building uh, uh, the first phase. And I, I suppose part of the discussion then uh, boils down to performance guarantee and the posting of the performance guarantee and what uh, the town may be uh, uh, willing to allow as to the posting if it is full development or if it might just be for the initial phase and then if subsequent <coughs> phases uh, were to move forward then uh, additional performance guarantee monies would have to be uh, uh, put forth with the town. We can have that discussion. I'm not sure how the town normally handles those things but that certainly it's a, a measure that the landowners are interested. Obviously if they don't have to post full performance guarantee when they're only seeking to construct one phase of it initially. So. We'll have that piece uh, of discussion, I guess, later on. And uh, the rest of the details as to the staff comments, indeed, our, our next pieces will have uh, more information in that regard. So overall, we think it's a, a good fit, right use for the zone. Uh, it's the type of site that is somewhat concealed from the public. Uh, these are the types of places where hopefully the small bu business community of uh, not only Scarborough but surrounding. I live in South Portland. and. We know full well that it's very difficult to find uh, a reasonable space for small business owners. You know, the two or three or four person firm with a couple of trucks and uh, they need to have somebody answering the phone on a routine basis. Just a, a, a good place to, to be able to set up shop. And uh, I know I've worked for uh, a couple of landowners over in Portland. In these types of buildings, there's a number of these. And they're, again, they're kind of in similar situations that they're hidden. You don't really see them, but uh, very well uh, uh, leased out. Uh, tenant demand is very high over in the, the Portland market for these types of space, and those are exactly the types of users that are in there. It's uh, you know small businesses that uh, need that uh, space. They don't want to work out of their house or out of their garage anymore. So, um, with that, I'll turn it back to the board. Thank you. Um, guessing we don't have anyone who wants to make public comment. So. Um, Robin, you want to start on this one? <coughs> um, so I, I agree. I think it's the right use for the zone um, because there was no existing um, plan. I took a drive down this weekend, and I'm wondering if when you drive down into the site, how far down will be developed? Because when you first get there and you go past main turf and greenery, and then it opens up and there's a couple you know, trailers on the side, and then it kind of closes back up. There's some more trailers, and it closes back up, and there's that sort of like laydown area next to it. Will that be under construction as well? Correct, yeah. That's okay. basically that area right there where the first phase of the building would be. Okay. And No, I'm talking further that way, Steve, toward you. Toward you. This direction? Yeah. Or so, so there's like... Uh, yeah, these, these are stockpiles right here. Right. And okay. Yeah, this survey was done just a little while ago, so I think those piles are still yeah. out there. 
Yeah, and then some, there's some piles too adjacent to I think what is the stormwater retention uh, or detention pond? Yeah, right over in here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's hard to tell. Uh, the, the the pond is uh, currently uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. We'll put it that way. Kind Agreed. of thing. Agree. So um, I think it's really important that we take advantage of that. And I know that you're seeking a landscaping waiver. Um, but there will be a lot of like uh, trees and buffer coming down, and um, you know I think there's opportunity there for, for vegetation. If I could ask them maybe with an emphasis on this boundary, since there's a user here, yeah. tracks and railroad over on this side, maybe this needs to have more emphasis. But asking the question more than yeah. anything else, I look for guidance from the board if if you thought that maybe it needed to be emphasized on this side of the yeah. the project site. And based on your layout, do you feel like you're going to be able to get the whole site to drain toward that existing uh, basin? Yeah, we're probably, uh, and I talked to Angela a little bit about this area. Yeah. I'm going to need to put in a probably a closed drainage system to get that sure. around. I'm comfortable enough that I can get okay. the grades to make that to work to drain over to the pond. Yeah. Uh, but right now the current plan really we've shown a closed drainage system out in front but we hadn't really captured much in the back and I need to do okay. that. So while you're working on it too, I, again I, I would say similar to the last presentation that you gave, is that traffic protection around the, the, the stormwater BMP is, is going to be even more important here if we're dealing with big trucks and, and plowing and the like, Steve. Yep. Um, so I, I hear, heard a couple things as far as lighting. You're not necessarily seeking a waiver because you are going to meet, meet a new building and new lighting, so you don't foresee a problem meeting the, the lighting standard. No. That is great news. Um, in addition to um, the stormwater permit with the DEP that uh, Dave Sinas and staff have identified, um, you may also want to consider the construction general permit in, in that area there. Um, and did you guys learn about that? <laughs> um, the other things um, that uh, I think I, I see as uh, potential there too would be um, you know, it, it is hidden and screened, and you know, mm -hmm. I, I like that. But but I think we should just. I'm going to leave it that we should really take advantage of the opportunity here at this site, and I commend the um, the owner for for redeveloping this area and providing some really good opportunity for uh, stormwater protection for, throughout the area there. I'll leave it at that. Make sure. Thank you. Yep. <coughs> Where's the front of the buildings on that? I'm not sure. The front. Front of the building would be on this side with doors, just entry doors. Okay, and the back side? Back side here with a entry door and overhead door. Oh, okay, and question for, for staff. If we approve the total area, but they're only going to build one of the pods, do they have to come back to the other pods, or is it... Uh, because my concern is that we approve the total area and they put Part A one way, Part B two another way, and Part C another way. Yeah, um, this isn't too dissimilar to the other discussion. I think we'll need to have a, a conversation with the applicant about the phasing. Certainly the board has approved phasing before, um, so I think there is an opportunity to work with them in, in, in light of what they're requesting. Um, exactly what that looks like and what the certain triggers are. Um, I think we can work through those details um, prior to next time it's before the board or as a condition when it does get to the board. Thank you. Um, since these are going to be contractors that are going to be leasing this facility, are they going to be leaving a lot of equipment outside? I guess my response is it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the landowner uh, being a tenant themselves, so they're planning on occupying Abco Rental will be in this first space here. In fact, they wanted uh, uh, a little bit wider because they, their own business is uh, leasing and rentals for uh, storage units and storage trailers and so forth. So uh, they have, in fact, another property here in, in town that uh, on occasion you will see there will be storage units and so forth. Uh, and they have the same thing over at this site. Um, how much of that and how it's 
conducted and operationally, let's just say it's over in this area, um, I would expect they would look for as much leniency relative to the zone in what those types of uses uh, might require, recognizing there's uses out there today that uh, manage it with storage of stockpiles. If it's a landscaper, well, he has mulch, he has topsoil, he's got some of his equipment, he's got uh, things that he's, you know, just they use on a day-to-day -day basis and they need outside storage of that. Uh, how the town goes about, um, you want to put it under the category of enforcement and operations of sites, we need to have a discussion of that. Let's talk about it and, and if there are any particular things that the, the town has specific interest in and uh, understanding how, <coughs> as an example, material stockpiles are conducted on this type of site, let's talk about it and there's a measure that needs to be put into place, then we'll work on it. That's we'll do that. And going to uh, staff notes, uh, the rear of the building, there's a lot of trees that are going to be removed and replaced with compacted gravel. Has that been delineated uh, and spelled out exactly how much of that space? I need to do that uh, better. Okay. And uh, you got to work with the town engineer on stormwater. Okay. Uh, you answered my question about the rear of the building. No storage. That has not been discussed. That I need to uh, discuss that probably more fully with uh, uh, with the owner and see exactly how they want to conduct that. Is a pretty good sized site, so we need to have a good understanding of, of where that's going to go. Because if we have a this year wasn't typical, but if we had one like last year, uh, we had a lot of snow. Uh, where do we go about doing that? It's a good sized property, so we have some advantages. But I think uh, marking it on the plan needs to be. Uh, done a little bit better and we'll do that. Um, like two, two quick things. Traffic analysis. The staff is, was asking for a traffic analysis considering, and I heard, we, I now understand that you're only going to build one, two, three, but still that still needs to be worked out between you and staff. Yeah, well. fortunately enough I have some pretty good data from <laughs> these other projects that I was referencing and uh, had not, I neglected to put that necessarily in the dispersed application package and so we'll do so now. I've got some uh, decent data for a couple of other projects uh, in the Portland market that I've worked on. So based on those trip generation rates, I can say here pretty confidently, not really worried about uh, trip generation, but we'll give you some good numbers uh, to be able to support that. And I don't know, you've been given two projects that just hit me as far as safety purposes are concerned. And again, based on how storage is going to be and configuration, uh, that needs to be spelled out also. I hear you. Okay. That's it, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ron. Yeah, if I could just quickly comment on the outdoor storage question. I think, I think it's a, a good question in terms of sort of the last application the board saw that was somewhat similar to this head was that Go Green landscaping application right. back in the right. summer. And I right. think that might be what you're referencing. Exactly. That, um, in that zone, for that property, that was a different zone in context in which outdoor storage was a special exception. And so they had to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals, and it really needs to be very narrowly defined. The industrial district allows for outdoor storage as just part of the understood activities. But I will note that it should be represented on the site plan and understood where that activity is going to occur. So there aren't the same confines around it, but where it is before the board for site plan, we do want to understand the full utility of the site. So to your question in terms of uh, I think uh, Mr. Bushy mentioned, um, you know, how the town enforces that. Well, we want to know where that those storage areas are supposed to be, and if you know things start to matriculate outside of that area, we can sort of rein those in. So, um, if you could just define those on the plan, you can utilize lots of area. Um, so, I just want to make sure that that point is made clear. I appreciate that. Yep. Thanks, Jed. <coughs> Mike. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I have a note here saying that you should uh, illustrate on the plan where you plan on putting outdoor storage materials. Mm -hmm. The um, the lot, the lot, where the lot, the definition of a lot in of itself, <clears throat> it it does. It, I don't think it's fully represented on on this. I don't see where it ends. 
I'm going to include uh, the full survey plan, which we do have and didn't make it into this particular Just plan. Just so I can get a sense of setbacks. And uh, right, like exactly. Okay. Yeah, no, we have that. Um, the, the road, as it comes in, the, I see the existing road, which is um, not shaded, correct? Correct. That's all paved, correct? <laughs> correct. It's paved up to... Uh, just short of the, there's a <coughs> fence system here at this front building. Oh, so it shows, the unshaded area shows an existing road that's un, that is paved, correct? Yep. And then, and then we see the new road that is shaded. Uh, so I'm curious, why, why the new road, uh, north, just no, north, if we can call that north, north of the page here, of the um, ABC rental and storage, the existing building? Why are we building a new road north of the current road? Why don't we just extend the current road? Well, we bandied about a number of different layouts here uh, with the owner, and, and the short explanation is we just wanted to provide a separate access route for these tenants here, recognizing that this area here is still being used by the landscape company, and I think they just wanted to uh, continue to have this space basically being used by the landscaper who's going to continue to occupy this front building, I believe, as well as these two. Okay, so then my next question is that uh, when you return, you probably should uh, illustrate on the plan um, wh where this unpaved area is that is used okay. for vehicle traffic. Right. Okay? Yep. I mean, I don't think any, <coughs> any of us really care whether it's paved or not. It's just that this gives me the impression it just abruptly stops, but there's a lot of activity that's actually occurring further on. Okay. We can provide some detail to yeah, that. I agree. You know, just you know, sketch in all the areas that the uh, the traffic will be. I think that just makes for a more complete understanding. That's all. Uh, I think. I think that's pretty much it. Um, is there any uh, lighting requirements along the road? I mean, is it is that necessary? I mean, can one travel this road back on to Pleasant Hill? at night without any concern? I mean, do you, do you need to put up a light pole or two or no? We, we don't feel so, uh, but I guess we need to listen to the board's uh, particular potential concerns. If <coughs> we I mean, can take I, a look at it and uh, I'll talk to the owner about that. And okay. uh, That might be a, a reasonable idea. I know there are some light poles over on the Pine Tree Wayside, but there aren't co those aren't providing enough coverage for this property by any stretch. I mean, how how long is this? Uh, I mean, I'm calling it a road. We could we could call it a driveway, I guess, right? But it is, but it's 24 feet wide. So how long is it? Well, you don't have to measure it now. But I mean, when you come back, maybe an understanding of its length, because um, I think that's important. Also, important okay. detail. You know, if you need if it needs to be serviced by emergency. You know, we need to get a sense of, you know... Yeah, it's, it's about 1,500 feet out to Pleasant Hill Road. Okay. So 1,500 feet, you know, it's not at our maximum, which is two, I think, 2,000. But uh, it, might, it might dictate some additional uh, guidance, lighting, reflector, I don't know, whatever else you want to do to aid people to go in and out, especially those that might have to service the area, police or fire, who might not be familiar with the, with the area, that's all. So... Uh, but anyway, uh, other than that, uh, no more questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure you don't want to go do a site walk right now? Nah, yeah, right now would be a good time. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, so as has been noted, uh, we obviously got some, some loose ends and a number of things to uh, either show clearly and show, illustrate clearly on the plans uh, and or um, sort of explore and flesh out in terms of um, Lighting, buffering, particularly on that, what I, I'll call the northeastern side of the of the site, where, as you pointed out, Steve, you actually got some uh, some of the butters there, as opposed to the other side where the where the tracks are. Okay. Um, and I would agree with uh, Robin that this is an opportunity to, to do something there without you know going too crazy. Um, also work with staff on kind of fleshing out the parking and and. Uh, and traffic implications, um, and as Ron noted, even with a phased approach, we need to know kind of going in that you've got the, you're prepared in terms of the, the parking and, and the traffic flow that that you could have if it's 
fully built out. So, um, make sure we're not missing anything. I think we've pretty much covered it all. Stormwater obviously needs to be flushed out a little bit more. Um, and again, it's just a lot of sort of loose ends, but I, none of it seems insurmountable. Um, you'll discuss phasing with staff um, and the implications of, of uh, potential approaches there in terms of <coughs> bonding and other logistics. Um, you can sort of talk that through with them and we'll hopefully see you again soon. Absolutely. All right. Great. Thank you. Anything else from us? We're good. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Good luck. So item number 10, uh, Main Seafood Ventures LLC uh, is tabled uh, due to the hour. Uh, saw the writing on the wall and requested to be tabled. So hopefully we'll see them at the next meeting and we thank them for their patience and understanding. We have a town planner's report. He has the benefit of the planning director here tonight, so if he has anything to report on, somebody give him a mic. Um, Nothing? Really? That's something. Let's make sure he has a mic. Yeah. So this is a town planner slash town engineer's report, I'll say, in that um, just the last week or two, the town's made a decision to move forward on some Oak Hill intersection improvements. It's also a transportation committee report in that um, Improvements have been planned for quite some time for the Oak Hill intersection to make some uh, crosswalk improvements, some traffic signal improvements, signal, um, pedestrian signal updates, and actually to, to complete some sidewalk that this board was involved in along Black Point Road. Uh, a few years ago, you approved and um, appropriately required Belvita to put in a sidewalk in, in front of that facility. This is right here at Oak Hill. Um, but right now it's, it's sidewalk to nowhere. So the project's going to complete the sidewalk up to Oak Hill and then down to the Oak Hill apartment. So this is um, also a bit of a public notice um, comment in that construction will start in the next few weeks. And so there'll be a period of time where getting through Oak Hill isn't ideal. Um, we're going to manage traffic to stay out of uh, early and um, late part of the day um, and get the work done before uh, May 1st. So this is a project again that Ron is near and dear to Ron's heart, so he'll tolerate some traffic congestion. Um, so that's a recent uh, development and update and I just wanted to thank the board for the stormwater workshop we had earlier this evening and for Conservation Commission, SEDCO, uh, Long Range Planning Committee for coming. I think we'll continue that stormwater discussion in the next next few months. So that's what I have. Thanks, Dan. Administrative amendment report. I do not believe we have any items to report this meeting. All right. Uh, we did have some correspondence um, specifically related to uh, the item that was uh, tabled earlier this evening uh, for Eastern Village Valentine development. Um, since it's pretty late, I'm not going to read them all. We got 14 different uh, <laughs> letters and emails which came in. Um, rest assured, we have them. If the, if the staff and all the board has them and, and has read them, they will be entered into the record. I do thank Karen for breaking these all out and listing them. And um, we, we thank you for that input and feedback. Any other correspondence to report? No? Any planning board comments? Yeah, I've got two. One, I will not be at the next meeting. I will be away. And just to follow up on Dan, we had a transportation meeting on 223, <coughs> and Dan presented one of the issues. The other is uh, Pine Point improvements were discussed, uh, and some work is going to be done around where the bridge is located uh, and uh, just short of uh, East Grand Ave, uh, trying to uh, appease traffic, pedestrians, and bikers. Um, and we, there will be some public meetings on that uh, in the near future, right? Yeah. 
Um, next Tuesday at the fire station down at Pine, Pine Point, correct? Yeah, 6.30. 6.30. So that's, I hope anybody interested in that would, would attend that meeting. Uh, we also discuss uh, Dunstan Corner, and it's going to, there's going to be some tweaking of the signals uh, at Dunstan to <coughs> make, the, I think they've done a good job to date, but just a little tweaking because sometimes the queuing gets a little backed up, so they're going to work on that to coordinate that a little better. Uh, and uh, most of the people are uh, happy with the improvements that have uh, gone on to date in that Dunstan area, uh, so uh, and so that's a good one. Uh, Eastern Trail update, uh, there's probably going to be a fundraising campaign since there's a lack of funds to try and connect, uh, I think, 1.6 miles. Um, so funding strategy is being discussed uh, by the appropriate people concerning that. And finally, uh, Long range, uh, we uh, decided to send a letter supporting Groom, uh, who want a, a another section of, from MTA uh, to encourage MTA to put it on their drawing board. Uh, so we affirmed our commitment to support them to push this to push MTA. It's just a lot going on, and a lot of fun. I'm enjoying it. So, but as I said, I will not be here in three weeks. Thanks, Ron. Um, I'll just quickly thank staff for the workshop that we had earlier this evening. That was very useful. It was good to spend some time with uh, a couple of the other boards and committees. I have one last comment. Yes. Corey, if I could just, um, uh, I wasn't able to make the stormwater workshop today as I had, had a deadline at work to take care of. And, um, but I do want to just, um, let, let the board know that I strongly support the staff in pursuing this, and I think it's a pr tremendous opportunity for the town. It'll provide consistency to the development community, which is so needed. Um, I think it really attracts development and the right, right kinds of development. It provides a better framework for the town to um, protect the valuable resources and uh, gives us a good sort of consistency measure among ourselves, too, to understand sort of the compliance and, and all the different stormwater levels that I'm sure that staff was really great at explaining. So just wanted to voice my, my support. Thank you. And I agree. I think it'll, it'll sort of integrate the process into our process better. Yep. It'll make things more predictable for applicants. And uh, I think it's definitely a feather in the town's cap, assuming that goes forward. So thanks. Any other comments? Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Thank you.